Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the uh, meeting of the Board of Selectmen for November 27, 2018. Previous to the meeting, the Board met in executive session to approve executive session minutes, consider litigation strategy with respect to the petition of Eversource Energy, to consider the purchase, sale, or lease or value of real property. Um, in that discussion in an open session will have a detrimental effect on the negotiating position of the board. So now we will open the um, main session of the Board of Selectmen and we'll start as usual with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And first on the agenda is uh, our public forum. Are there any residents who would like to uh, offer comments this evening? Jean. Hi, Jean. This feels familiar. How are you? <laughs> Um, I am Jean Birchman. I'm just here to share some good news on Giving Tuesday. I'm here on behalf of Ann Matina, who's teaching tonight. Um, but I wanted to, I'm sure all of you are aware that she has started an effort this year called Hopkinton Gives. And what she did was reach out to a number of nonprofits in Hopkinton and create a common website where all of them have linked their donation pages and their logos, um, links to their website, so people can go to one central location and see all of the many, many organizations in Hopkinton that do um, such great volunteer work for our community. So today is Giving Tuesday, and that was the big push, was for everybody to be sharing this common website and learning not just about, not donating just to their own favorite organization, but learning more about other organizations in the town. And so there are still a few hours left in Giving Tuesday, and I wanted to take this opportunity to share with you what she's done and invite you, if you haven't already, to share that with your friends, or as long as your meeting adjourns before midnight, you can still participate when you get home. So um, really, that's all. I'm just here on her behalf. She has 22 organizations signed up uh, this year, which is fantastic. Um, and she did this on, she started on behalf of the Hopkinton Historical Society, and they already have surpassed their Giving Tuesday total. As of this morning, they had done that already. So hopefully, everybody else is, is having a similar level of success. And that's all. Just wanted to share the good news. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. The Giving Tuesday uh, Hopkinton Gives site is a wonderful idea. It was up prominently on Hop News and just this one-stop shopping idea. I know I went on to it and ended up making, you know, a couple contributions to organizations I would have would not have necessarily thought of because but because they were all displayed together in that one spot. It was like while I was at it oh, I'll do this and I'll do that. So the idea of that sort of one-stop shopping r really does work. It's, it's a great idea. So um, Annie, when you get a chance, big thanks to you for, for doing that for Hopkinton. Is there anybody else? You want to wait for Mary until the, uh, that later? Okay. That's, that's later in the agenda. Okay, well, hearing none, um, I do want to first say a big thanks to HCAM for, again, accommodating us on such short notice uh, in the event of the emergency that occurred today at Town Hall. They are always there through flood and all kinds of uh, disasters. They, they step up to the plate to help us get through with, with wonderful facilities and, uh, and wonderful amenities. And so thank you. Thank you, HCAM. And on that subject, uh, Mr. Kamala will give us an update on the situation with Town Hall, and I believe we have another, a number of our municipal officials here to answer questions if needed. Mr. Kamala, tell us the bad news and the good news. <laughs> it's always good news. Um, <laughs> Started out as bad news, <laughs> getting better. Yeah, with, with, through the chair, um, I want to share with the, the public that the the Hopkinton Town Hall and Public Library uh, remain closed at this time. Uh, this is due to an elect electrical problem that occurred this morning. Um, in summary, 
uh, a shot in the power service lines from the utility pole right in front of town hall resulted in a surge of power and eventual loss of power within the building. Uh, this in turn resulted in the loss of municipal internet and some municipal phone lines, including non-emergency business lines uh, at the police department, DPW, library, and senior center. I need to really emphasize this. At no time was the 911 network down and public safety <coughs> response remained at full capacity throughout the day. Here's what is happening tomorrow. We have identified key town departments that will operate from the Hopkinton Public Library beginning at 10.30 a.m. Uh, this includes the town manager's office, the town clerk's office, the finance department, land use department, including Board of Health. We are asking individuals from this department to perform primary routine business transactions and answer any questions from the public. In terms of the repair work at Town Hall, I am at least pleased to report the following. The response team by our public safety officials, inspectional teams, and Eversource this morning was timely, professional, and on point. Uh, we quickly identified the issue and immediately, um, based on the information that we, have, we had gathered preliminarily, assembled the Hopkinton Emergency Management Group. And in those discussions, we came up with a response plan. Uh, and as part of that response plan, we have acted on several issues that at least allow us uh, to, as I said, have some of our offices operating from the library beginning tomorrow at 10.30 a.m. Uh, and at this point, I want to share and actually commend Deputy Chief Bill Miller, uh, Chuck Hadlick, the building inspector, <coughs> the police chief, Chief Lee, uh, Josh Grossetti, the IT director, uh, as well as Dev Daltorio. Um, they have been on point, they have been forecast, uh, they spent the whole day making sure that everybody did their part, and also the relationships that they have built with the utility companies and the contractors that work with the town actually enabled us to respond timely uh, to this issue. It also goes without saying that the continued investment by the community in town hall infrastructure put us in a position where we immediately mitigated the impact of the damage. And most spectacularly, most spectacularly, also allowed us to start planning going forward. And at this point, I'll let the board ask any questions that you may have. I'll just have one question. Um, did this incident, was it related at all to the storm that came in the night before with the water and the winds, or it was total, uh, totally unrelated? At this point, we believe it was totally unrelated. Yeah. It was between the pole that's directly in front of the town hall and the underground wiring that goes into the town hall. So it was the underground cable that was affected that shorted out. Okay, so it wasn't like we've had water penetration yeah. issues historically in the basement of yeah. town hall and all that wasn't it. So just Correct. thank you. Other questions from board members? I think that was a pretty copious explanation by Mr. Kamala. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, pretty thorough as always and it's just nice to see. Um, you, know, you always know that you know you see the, the police and fire there that are always ready to go DPW but it's nice to see all the <coughs> departments in town mobilize and uh, Work, uh, work together to, to uh, kind of overcome whatever hurdles that come about. So, uh, tip of the hat to uh, Mr. Cadillac, Mr. Miller, Mr. Mr. Kamalu, Mr. Lee, anyone else? 
Chiefly, sorry, not Mr. Best best guess as to when we'll be back up and running. So, as of six fifteen tonight, we are actually operating on generator power. So we have heat back in the building. We have our internet for the town wide back up and running. Josh is working on that as we speak. We've been running it off of our rescue for the last five or six hours. We've switched over now to the generator. Um, the electrical company had just finished pulling the cables, the new cables to replace the ones that had shorted out. So we're looking sometime tomorrow to have power, street power restored back to the building. And then Chuck and I uh, with um, Ed Hicks are gonna be going room by room to make sure nothing was done because we don't know the electrical service or anything that may have happened um, with the spike into the building. So hopefully maybe Thursday back in. Yes. Yes. That's our, our projection. Yeah. Did the main breaker trip? It did not, Brian. No. Did it blow? <clears throat> it blew the ground out of the basement uh, and shot it out into the basement. It blew the ground. You know, there's an eight inch water main coming in steel. Yeah. So the building is all, everything's grounded to that. It blew the ground the, the, uh, right off the, the eight inch main. So it was a pretty good surge. How old that main, we know? It's actually not that old. No, that was, that part That's of that really was replaced from the <clears throat> water main leak, or water leak we had. Who did the electric work? The, Pulling the new cables? No. Who put that main? Who put that new main breaker in during the water building? The flood. After the rehab? flood. Well, none of that. No, well, none, none of that, that was touched. Was replaced. No. Oh, that was not touched. That no. was not touched. No. Okay. Nope. <clears throat> okay. Nope. That main should have tripped. So something's wrong there. No. Yeah. That's why we're not going to be turning everything back on in one shot tonight. We're there was take a, our there time. was a surge through the building, and in the board of health. In the next room, there's an electrical panel that was actually vibrating. humming and vibrating. As in, in the wall in the um, planning director's office, it was the same thing, just noises in the wall. And then we went, then the lights went out. Half the lights went out. So I'm in the electric business. Forgive me one last question. So is that 40 volt coming in or is it 240? 440. Right. Yeah, it's 208. 208. Well, so yeah, it's 208, yeah, right, so right. 440. Okay. Yep. So it's not dry types, it's something else. Yeah. So. What else that here? Sorry. Okay, thank you, gentlemen. Excellent. Thank you. Great. Thank, thank you. you. Mr. Kamalo. Thank you. Thank you. Let's hope this is the last of our <laughs> town hall disasters for a while. Yeah. Number two, coffee three. Number three. <laughs> I do have one question for Mr. Mr. Um, yes, please. Uh, as far as conducting town business, getting permits and things, is the building, I mean, where should, uh, where should the public go? Yeah, beginning tomorrow at, um, at 11 a.m., uh, the public can go to the Hopkinton Public Library. Okay. Yes. Again, we'll be conducting minimal <laughs> services. Um, Anybody with questions or basic inquiries can still contact town staff through our town email. So will that be up on the website, all those, all those offices and where they're going to be located tomorrow? Yes. As we're speaking, I'm sure Josh is, is, yeah. is getting ready to send out a message. Maybe get that to Hop News, too. He yeah. had a whole thing up on it. Yeah. Okay. All right. Good. Um, well. We now come to our volunteer recognition, and this evening, uh, thanks to Bob Levinson's wonderful program that he initiated, we have a host of wonderful vol volunteers to recognize, and the fact that there are so many of them does not diminish at all the uh, quality and the importance of each of their contributions. Um, there are a group that have been part of the Sharon Timlin organization, but first I think I will mention two um, individuals. Uh, is Heather Smith here tonight? Okay. Is Alec Levine here tonight? Well, we have a, a, a nomination and an award for Heather Smith, who was nominated by Jennifer Andrews. So I'll set this aside and it'll be available in the uh, Board of Selectmen's office for Heather when she wants to pick it up. And Alec Levine was nominated by Ann Marcy. Ann, I see you here. Do you want to just say a word about Alec uh, 
and why you nominated him. He's on his way. Oh, he's on his no, way. Wrong one. Wrong message. No. <laughs> we can. Oh, we can. I thought it was Thursday night. Oh. <laughs> Well, speak up for Alec for just a quick minute. Just. Okay. They thought it was Thursday night, I guess. Uh, no, Selectman, I always meet on Tuesday. Uh, well, okay. Alec has really... Gotta come, up um, to come up to the mic real, real quick. Just tell, her, tell us about Alec and tell him well, that we will... Well, I'm not allowed enough, so everybody can hear me. This will be available in the office for him. Uh, Alec volunteers for a lot, you know, and uh, he does Special Olympics. He was one of the originators of the Hopkins and Youth Basketball Program uh -huh. many years ago. And one of the big things that he does is he works with Parkinson's patients mm -hmm. and boxing to help with their balance, I guess. But he does it, well, maybe three days a week. He does it in North Bro and he does it in Holliston, I believe. Oh, wow. And uh, so it's really helped these people. So I just feel that Alec has done a lot and yeah. deserves recognition. And, and is he a student or is he a, a, um, a, an adult? I oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he's been... I don't, been, know, uh, I don't know Alec. No, I don't. Awesome. He's been the director of the Special Olympics, Hopkins and Special okay. Olympics. Okay, okay. Um, I'm going to say probably 15 years, oh. as long as I've been doing it. So oh. it's probably 15 years. That, well, yeah. my apologies for not knowing him, but I'm so glad you nominated him, and that's a wonderful thing. Yeah. So, um, congratulations, and well, I'm thank sorry, you, Alan. <laughs> We're sorry we had the mix up, but tell, please tell him to come to the Board of Selectmen's office, and I we'll, will. we'll get I this will. to him. Okay. Thank you, thank you, <laughs> thank you. Good, Thanks, good Bob. choice, <laughs> good choice. And uh, Bob, maybe you can speak to this next group. I think there's about 26 here, uh, and uh, as I understand, they've all been part of the Sharon Timlin mm -hmm. group. Uh, and you s told me earlier that uh, Dr. Brown, who's part of the Timlin organization, is here tonight too. So, why don't you tell us a little bit about the organization, what these young these people have done? Okay, thank you. And um, <clears throat> just with uh, with Heather and Alec, mm -hmm. uh, and and the, as a nominator, um, it reflects the breadth and the depth of uh, volunteering that happens across the town. It really represents the spirit of Hopkins, and so I'm thrilled to be able to do this tonight back in front of you, representing Chief Flannery, Gene Birchman, and Dottie Ferreter Wallace from the Volunteer Recognition Committee. And uh, yeah, it is my privilege to talk about the, uh, the, the Sharon Timlin Road Race. I'll read a little bit here before I read off all the names. Um, it, for the, and I'll just read my nomination, uh, and, and Chief Flannery, we decided to put the names in. Uh, for the past 15 years, <clears throat> excuse me, close to 2,000 runners have towed the start line on the Loop Road to run the Sharon Timlin Memorial 5K run to cure ALS, also known as Lou Gehrig's disease. <clears throat> this is a horrific and currently incurable progressive neuromuscular disease that robs its victims of the use of their muscles. And if anybody's seen it up close, you understand why people like uh, those on the committee have such passion for it. It's awful to watch. Um, unfortunately, uh, I've seen it up close and a number of people on the committee have too. So mm -hmm. the, you can see where the energy and the dedication and the passion come from for everybody who's involved in ALS research and raising money. Uh, this is a 100% volunteer committee that oversees the race and Family Fun Day and has raised close to $2 million since the race began. Uh, the committee is extremely dedicated, putting in countless hours raising money and managing a multitude of details to ensure a great day for all, runners and their families, emphasizing the family day as well. It's a massive undertaking and it's handled with great care and devotion. Uh, the Timlin race is now an eagerly anticipated event in Hopkinton. Uh, it's very popular in the running community and uh, has become the second most well-known race that starts in Hopkinton. Um, <laughs> What's the other one? Uh, I think it's on the agenda later. I'm not sure, though. Uh, the committee has uh, very low operating costs, and all members are very committed to the effort of raising awareness uh, and uh, raising money to cure this uh, horrific disease. So I'm very I'm thrilled to be able to do this tonight, along with Chief Flannery and the committee. And I'm also thrilled to have Dr. Brown here, who changed his schedule uh, because he felt so strongly about uh, the committee uh, led by Abby and her great team and he said he wanted to be here to say a few words and Dr. Brown leads the uh, neurology lab at uh, UMass Medical Center and his lab is a direct beneficiary of um, 
of the funds that are raised by the race. So if I can call up Dr. Brown. Thank you for having us, Dan. Oh, please. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Brown, for coming tonight. Well, thank you. This is a, an honor. As you've heard and as you know, ALS is a devastating disorder that takes individuals from vigorous good health to death from respiratory paralysis, typically in three or four or five years. Um, it is called an orphan disease, and we struggle with that because sometimes that makes fundraising difficult. But the reality of the statistics is that more than a half a million Americans now alive today will die from ALS. And I would submit that is not an orphan disease at all. The problem is, and you've just heard it said, we have no good therapy for ALS. And Abby Rosenberg has just had an enormous impact on trying to change that through the work she has done, through the work of her extraordinary committee, the Timlin family, and if I may say, the town of Hopkinton in this race that they have run so successfully. Uh, upwards of $2 million have been raised, and that has all gone toward trying to discover innovative new ways to understand and treat ALS. Only this year, two new types of therapies have been tried, turning off ALS genes as one example of how powerful her fundraising has been. So on behalf of all of us in the laboratory and 20 odd labs that work on this disease, on behalf of all the patients we see in the clinic and their families, uh, I want to say from the bottom of my heart how much we appreciate what Abby has done, what the committee has done, the Timlin family, and the remarkable people of Hopkinton who've made this so successful. Thank you, Abby. Just have a little bit more to say, and again, if you've been to the race, and I think all of you have, you see, you know the feel of the day. It's just a marvelous day. There's this undercurrent of sadness because of why you're there, but uh, what they've done to make that a fabulous day is just should be recognized. Uh, I had a few more words uh, to read uh, from a person who was involved in the race as well, Mike Timlin, former pitcher for the Boston Red Sox, who wanted to have uh, some words spoken tonight. He said, thanks for letting me speak without being there. Uh, let me start by saying that this group of volunteers are truly amazing. Never in my life have me and my family been so blessed by a group that shares our heart as much as they do. We came up with the idea of having a run to honor my mother, and this group led by Abby took off with it. It's hard to put into words how Don and I feel about all the volunteers throughout the years we've been involved with doing this run. I should have told him not to do this. I'm going to be trying to get through this. Uh, God has truly blessed the Angel Fund with the likes of these people, and they continue to do this from the goodness of their heart, along with their own personal story being touched by this terrible disease. Thank you all for what you have done for me, my family, and the Angel Fund. We love you guys. Congratulations on this recognition. Um, a day later, I got another message from Mike. He said, and I'm quoting verbatim. Can you also mention about Abby and Rich? What, amazing, what an amazing job they have done raising two boys that have hearts for others by raising funds to support this run. They are great parents and great examples of how you should live life. Uh, so uh, just, you know, great, uh, great opportunity to say thanks to all these folks. Now, I will read all the names. I know they're not here, but I have a few key folks, and um, I'll read the names. Of the, Abby Rosenberg, Dave Kruger, April Galenic, Stephanie Whalen, Kathy Yunus, Don Mercier, Lauren Mercier, Gail Welsh, Colleen Allen, Courtney Pinto, Kieran Tumbledon, Michelle Kinsella, Cara Dion, Tracy Logan, Diane Koshef, Marie Marchetti, Diane Bird, Mark Saloy, Elaine Alden, Lisa Stevenson, Maureen Tumbledon, Betsy Kruger, Ellen McAleff, I'm sure I'm butchering some names, Ali Baster, Patrick Welsh, and uh, Sue Hadley. Uh, give you a sense of this, what, an, what a uh, logistical issue this is that, to run this, and all these people do it with smiles on their faces. So uh, just glad to do this. And who's ever on that list who wants to come up, and we can uh, pass these out, it'd be great. Thank you. That's wonderful. And Dr. Brown, for you taking your time out of oh, your schedule to you. come all the way, that really, that really speaks volumes it's about this organization. Thank you. It really our, does. Here's our representatives so, here. From I think Abby is here, is she not? Abby's right here. Abby Rosenberg. We've got all these wonderful certificates, and I think the ones for those who are not here, we'll keep them in the in the Sleckman's office for them to be picked up. But Abby? Thank you so much. Abby Rosenberg, thank, thank you. You, you, are, you are the heart and soul of this organization. It's, it's truly a group effort, and um, a group effort both for the committee and UMass and the Timlin family and the town, the Fort Sleckman and 
schools and all volunteers, um, 200 plus volunteers that show up every day. And I mean, every day. Every day. <laughs> <laughs> it feels like every day. <laughs> now, really, and uh, we've had new people, old people um, that have come back for 16 years, and uh, some that have just joined us this year. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Job, thank you. Well, you. Thank you. We'd also like to recognize and say thank you to David Kruger. Not here. David's not here. To April Galanik. Nope. Stephanie Whalen. Yep. Stephanie's here. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you very much. Well deserved. Kathy Eunice. Don Mercier. Lauren Mercier, Gail Welch. You're gonna do it, take it for Gail? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> don't look like Gail. <laughs> Give her our thanks. Thank you, yeah. Colleen Allen. Thank you, Colleen. Well deserved. Courtney Pinto. Kieran Tumbleton. No. Yeah. He's out running. Michelle Kinsella. There's Michelle. Great. Thank, Thank you for Thank coming. Michelle. Thank you for all you've done. Karen Dion. Tracy Logan. No. Diane Koshev, no. Marie Marchetti, Diane Bird, Mark Salois, Salois, no. I may eat Frenchman to me, <laughs> Elaine Alden, Lisa Stevenson, Maureen Tumbleton, Betsy Kruger, Ellen McAuliffe, Allie Balster, Patrick Welch. Are you really Patrick Welch? <laughs> <laughs> you just taken two. <laughs> Congratulations, job, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> and finally, Sue Hadley. Well, thank you to everyone, and the fact that there is such a huge stack says a whole lot about this organization. So thank you to everyone who, who does so much for this great group. And, um, and thanks to Bob and, and Chief Lannery Emeritus uh, for, uh, for putting so much effort into this. No kidding. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Emeritus. Um, him and Clark. Our next on the agenda is very short. Our consent agenda simply consists of the board minutes, uh, the board of selectmen minutes from the November 13, 2018 meeting. So moved. All second. right. Moved and seconded. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed, that is unanimous. Okay. And uh, now, is, is Sarah Bateman here? Okay. Well, um, we had taken a couple moments, I'll, I'll certainly want to speak to it, uh, to recognize Sarah Bateman. Sarah Bateman is the Veterans Services Director for the Metro West Region, which of course covers us, and uh, she was quite surprised and honored at the October conference. Um, it was the Veterans Service Conference. She was honored to receive or our district, because of her leadership, received the Veterans District of the Year Award for Outstanding Service to Veterans. So we thought it was a appropriate thing to honor Sarah and to let everyone know about the great services that our, uh, our Veterans District of Metro West provides to veterans. And um, say thank you to Sarah Bateman for the great job she's done um, 
obviously in receiving this award for the Veterans District. So, sorry she's not here tonight, but um, congratulations. It's uh, nothing more important than giving good services to our veterans. So, all right. Moving on. We have the Marathon Fund Committee Charge. The, <clears throat> the Board of Selectmen will discuss the Marathon Fund Committee Charge. And as I understand it, just as a point of clarification, the Marathon Fund Committee itself will be holding their own discussion and decision on their charge in January. But the idea tonight is not that this board will be making decisions as much as providing input um, for them to have when they meet in January. Am I stating that correctly? Yes. Mr. Kamalo. Okay. So I think we all have a copy of the Marathon Fund charge as it now stands. Um, is, this, is this charge as it's written now and what was provided in our packet, is this the existing policy or is this a proposed new new wording for the charge this is the proposed new wording for the charge okay um, which I discussed pre preliminarily with two representatives of the marathon fund committee uh, I did present the gist of the gist discussion at the last board of selectmen meeting and the request that is received from the board back then was you needed to uh, be afforded the opportunity to provide your input and so today is the day for you to provide the input i will take that input share it again with the two representatives of the marathon fund committee the committee itself is scheduled to meet sometime in january and can you encapsulate is there much of a change between this proposed charge and the language that was in the charge they were working from before Yes. Um, in fact, what we had before was a recitation of the history of the Marathon Committee and the Marathon Fund Committee. Mm -hmm. And there was also an articulation of the programs that the committee could fund. Mm -hmm. In addition, there was also an outline of the process that is followed in allocating the different grants through the marathon fund program. Okay. Yeah. It's listed twice in our Yeah, I think that was just in our a tablet. Mistake. Is that just a scrivener's thing? We don't need it twice. It's not like one's the old and one's the new. Correct? You have to, it's not linked, you just have to scroll through. So yeah, there, there were there were two copies of it, but I think okay. that's just two Same copies. Thing, yeah. yeah, it was two copies. So so um, if, I, if I just may, just for clarification, um, so the, uh, on the second page where it says the Board of, uh, I'm looking at here. So was this wording, this, this new wording that we have was put, drawn up by who? By? The, the yeah. wording that you have in front of you was drafted by the town manager. Okay. Incorporating the points discussed in my meeting with the two representatives from the Marathon Fund Committee. Okay. This draft has already been shared with those two representatives. They are reviewing it uh, and we'll continue our conversation leading to the meeting of the Marathon Fund Committee in January next year. All right. Um, <coughs> Madam Chair, can I ask a question? Mr. Mr. Her. So, Mr. Kamal, up in the purpose, per the town's marathon policy, the person of the athletic the, the monetary payments of the town, it paid as reimbursement for expenses are considered a gift to the town. The use of such funds is subject to any conditions placed thereon by the BAA, as well as any further restrictions adopted by the Board of Selectmen period. Yeah. So is the language in there about the use of such funds and such funds is subject to any conditions placed thereon by the BAA. Is that new? That is not new. That language is actually in the town's marathon policy, the general policy that relates to 
all marathon activities in town. Okay, so just fine. Yeah. They've not stuck their nose into this and sort of said, no, you can't do this, yes, you should do that in the past. So I'm okay with it, so long as that practice is how, sort of how they continue to guide indirectly the distribution of these funds. Do you see any problem with that? Um, no, I do not see any problem in that. Um, each year, the BAA um, has a global discussion with town officials on the use of the uh, marathon resources. Uh, and if there are any changes that they propose, they will therefore go through that process where initially there's a discussion with town officials. And if it's an issue that, if, if an issue is raised that needs to be escalated to the board, that issue will then be brought to the board before it's put in place. Mr. Coutinho, does that make sense to you? I don't know, it sounds like there's a lot of there's strings that I didn't realize that were there when it came to the marathon fund money. You know, because we just got that letter from them a couple meetings ago where the um, disbursement was increased um, oh, what, about ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 or something. And, um, you know, and it goes to, you know, it goes to, you know, uh, um, you know, helping out the town with uh, you know some of the expenses that we have, but put in you know by hosting at the start. So I'm just wondering, yeah, um, you know, because it, you know, the, the the marathon fund um, vets any anything that comes in front of them, and then we further vet it sometimes to uh, so <laughs> and um, you know. So I'm just wondering. The use of such funds is subject to any conditions placed thereon by the BAA. So uh, I'm just wondering, you know, maybe I should bring that up at, at the next meeting with the BAA. In fact, to be clear, a gift is a gift. The giver of a gift can attach conditions. At this point, there are only two conditions that have been in place, and they predate the formulation of the policy currently in place regarding marathon related activities. Those conditions are one, part of that gift pays for the cost borne by the town in hosting the marathon. And the second piece is the remainder of the money is a gift to be used by the town for activities related to sporting activities and wellness. Those are the two current conditions. I do not want anybody thinking that there are some additional restrictions that have been placed regarding the gift. Again, a gift is a gift. So, the so giver of the gift <laughs> can specify conditions that they see or deem necessary. Can I it's, up to the, it's up to the receiving entity to either accept those conditions or not. So in answer to Brian's question, the town, if ever there are any future restrictions which don't exist now, the town will have the opportunity to discuss, accept or not accept those restrictions. And, and I appreciate you saying that. I would challenge, not directly, but just challenge the concept of a gift as a gift when a gift comes uh, following a, a, a parade permit. Okay, so the Boston Marathon does not happen unless the citizens of Hopkinton wish it to happen. And we do. But to say that it is a pure gift and we have no control over what comes as a result of the gift coming in, or that there's a lot of strings attached to it, and I know you're not saying that, but I just wanted to challenge you on that concept of the gift. This is a 50-50 partnership with the Boston BAA to host the Boston Marathon here in Hopkinton. We don't want to change that at all. But I saw this language as additional strings as well, but you're saying it's been there before, so I'm okay with that. But I don't want to go beyond that and say that you know we're lucky to have it because there's a hundred grand worth of expense that we incur as a community uh, and we're not going to ask the taxpayers to pay for that the BAA does pay for that through this gift okay so I wouldn't call it a gift I'd call it a payment and then there's additional funds as part of the deal with the parade permit concept that comes in as well so that we can fund these well-being and you know youth fitness programs and things like that could I do the chair may I propose an amendment 
to that <laughs> language. Look at him. Well, we're no, just, no, if you could just put those two conditions, no, if we could put those two conditions, <laughs> just put those two conditions in as opposed to, as opposed to what we have, uh, oh, my, my screen shut off. Uh, but as but. I understand it, we're not, we're simply making comments for the Marathon Fund Committee. We're not making motions or votes yeah. or anything like no, that. Well, no, no, I'm just giving input. So input to change. to make an amendment, you can suggest. No, no, amending, I'm saying that make amending, I make a suggestion okay. to amend the language to say the use of such funds is subject to any conditions placed thereon. The use of such funds is subject to those two conditions. If that's what it Mr. is. Mr. Clow, so I'm not yeah. sure what's the best exactly. way to work that out. Yeah. To, 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 to the chair's point, we're not going to decide it. We're not supposed to decide anything tonight. The no. Marathon Fund Committee really should be getting first crack at this after we give some yeah. input. So that's some input. We're concerned about that language. Okay, I think we, we can pick up. Or just a one. Exactly. Or just yeah. a so one. So take that to the Marathon Fund Committee and yourself and Elaine, mm. and maybe sort through that a little bit. And then when we decide, then we can get because into the Marathon changes. Fund Committee. I'm sorry, through the chair, the Marathon Fund Committee doesn't disperse the money to pay for um, police details and all that stuff. So actually, it's only it's, it really comes down to what you clarify later on as. Sports related, you get it, get into it uh, later on. Extra funds. They uh, get what's what's left after all the expenses. Well, no, no, no. This is the extra yeah. funds, though. So, you know, th this already is the. We're already down one level from that. The the extra funds. This the marathon fund committee doesn't get that hundred and no. Ten, twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars, whatever it is. That's they true. just get the leftover. Yep. So this already is one tier down. Yep. So so it really it you know to to have that you know what it really comes down to. Is the line? Um, sorry. Uh, you make recommendations. Board of Selectmen regarding expenditures. The emphasis on projects that have athletic or recreational purpose. So, see, that says right there the charge. It's in the charge right there, as opposed to putting, uh, you know, is uh, you know, anything with the gift to the town because it's already one level down from that gift to the town. Mr. Kamala, are we guaranteed? that there's always going to be monies additional than what it costs the town to post this? No. So that's a, that's a concern that I have is... Um, yeah, know, but that's where that license, that's where the parade permit comes in for the following year. For the following year, but what, what happens if uh, they decide that, or, or however the marathon is run this year, the, uh, the cost borne to the town is three hundred thousand dollars, and the marathon committee. I mean, the the BIA decides to give us one hundred and twenty thousand dollars. What's to say? Then that's their last yeah. marathon. That's not in, that. Yeah. No, in fact, well, in theory, yeah. it's not going to happen. But if Dave McGilvery is someday replaced by Bernie Madoff, uh, then, then maybe <laughs> that's not going to happen either. <laughs> well, <laughs> Mr. Kamala, yeah. can you address that? Yeah. And in fact, this addresses the question that was raised by Mr. Hare. The gift is not attached to the town's regulatory process. In answer to Mr. Tedstone's comment, it is commonly understood between the town and the BAA that the BAA will fully account for the cost of processing its permit application. Great. And we Perfect. talk about that when we yes. can do a parade. Right. Right. So that's when that, you're, you're, you can be comfortable when we do the permit in the spring. And okay. they, I'm always, they, I'm always comfortable. Yeah. They sent us yes. correspondence a while back about what they would be giving us this year and very generous increases for the next few years, anticipating increased costs and um, their commitment to the town of Hoppington. I mean, there's always a chance that there was something unexpected and there's going to be a difference. But looking out several years ahead, they were very generous in, in giving us scheduled increases to meet anticipated future needs. So for 2016, following the year following the bombing, uh, there was some discussion about increased cost as a result of increased security, and there was no, I mean, there was, it was a very short discussion. It was, yep, yeah, no problem. No question. Yeah, yeah. And I don't want anyone to think that I'm implying that the BAA is trying to pull the wool over anyone's eyes. I just want to cover the town 
to make sure that yeah. it is a net, at least a net zero for us. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if we can switch gears, I don't know whether the, these prior, this prioritization existed in the old charge, but it, it seemed to me that the introductory statement says that uh, it would be, have an emphasis on projects that have an athletic or recreational purpose or contribute to the health and wellness of Hopkinton residents. And most of the fund disbursements we've approved in recent memory had very clear uh, benefits to a group, whether it was a team or an organization or the senior center exercise program. Um, this says priority one shall be scholarships and then priority two, if funds are available, the committee may recommend expenditures for the following purposes. And then you get into recreational, various recreational things. I, I don't understand why scholarships are the first priority because that, as wonderful as they are, benefits just an individual student or students as opposed to community-wide. Um, and, and I would just, and, and maybe there would be the possibility that in one year a committee would look at this and only give out scholarships and not give and any there's, other there's athletic support. Of, there's, a fine, there's, there's a finite amount of them. It's the, the same amount every year, the scholarships. Yeah. And that's, that's been the tradition since, since it started. Was the, uh, what's it, I think there's like two male and two female or something like that. It's, it's very limited. Well, I, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with scholarships. I'm just surprised that priority one is scholarships. It makes it seem like the primary purpose for this is not first and foremost a scholarship fund. And I thought priority number one was recreational activities that benefit a wider segment of the town. If I may, um, in fact, the scholarships are awarded to high school students who are Hopkinton residents for athletic distinction and outstanding community service. Mm -hmm. Although the scholarship may be going to an individual, the individual's activities in the community have by benefited a wider um, okay. a, a number of people. That's one. The other piece is, in fact, the prioritization is past practice. Mm -hmm. This is how it's actually done. It may not have been articulated clearly in the prior charge. Mm -hmm. In my discussions with the two representatives from the F Marathon Fund Committee, it was very clear that this is exactly what they do on the ground. This is what they've been doing over the years. So we're simply memorializing past practice. So are we guaranteed, Mr. Continue, you said there's a certain number that they always do. Mm -hmm. It's not articulated here, but are we guaranteed that it will always be limited to like a certain number and then there will be more community wide or could we the way this is worded some year they have a whole bunch of new scholarships and suddenly no, it no. turns into just basically totally a scholarship no, no, there, there, there's, uh, and, and I forget what the number is but it's 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 just a, a, a couple of males and a female scholarships or maybe three each I, I, I forget at this point but, but what's to prevent that from turning into four ten well, because it hasn't, it, it hasn't in all the years that I've been involved with it. Well, maybe that should be one of our comments. Is I mean, it yeah, it could. To a certain number, uh, yeah. uh, certain number of. Well, they've never, they, they've never changed it. So. Well, no. I, I know you're saying they never have, but that isn't a restrictor. That's not a restricting thing just to say it's never happened before. I just, I would not just, personally want to see this any year. Just additional scholarships be added for whatever reason and it turn into strictly for lack of funds so a we could clarify what those program. are the charge could clarify what those are right it, it just yeah. it just seems to me that some of these mon monies should go to the community wide athletic recreational health and wellness purposes um, that benefit a broad section of the community yes, they do well this is where we might well, need to put right back now. from them they do right now but I would like to make sure that that's okay, caused. Okay, so that's some in good fact, feedback to take to the committee. Yes, in fact, as I reported at the last Board of Select meeting, in addition to developing this draft charge, there are other two activities that we agreed to do. 
Uh, one, Colleen is putting together an SOP, Standard Operating Procedure, for the scholarship process. Therefore, the point that the board is now discussing can be included in that SOP. The second SOP that the representative from the Marathon Fund Committee is working on is an SOP for the other grants, meaning priority number two. Mm -hmm. uh, I have received, for example, questions from the public in terms of if anybody is interested in applying for a grant through the Marathon Fund process, how do they do that? Where do they get the forms? The SOP will articulate that process. And that can spell out the two historical for the male, two historical for the female, and yeah. Um, don't don't call me on the on the two. I understand. Three. Yeah. 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 But I mean, I would hope that in any given year, these funds would be dispersed in a mixture of ways, so it isn't all wouldn't ever be consolidated in only one purpose, um, because I would hope that the whole town participates in the marathon. The whole town bears sometimes the brunt of the marathon um, and it just seems that in the spirit of the BAA getting back to the town there should be um, these monies should to some extent at least be used to benefit a wider a wide section of, of the town sure one of the, one, if I may, may throw the chair, one of the great things about reading some of the um, applications that the um, students write it's 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 wonderful to see um, the um, the breadth of the work that they do, and, and when, when you when you get 100 150 applications, and and to see the, the them really um, try for this, and it, it's 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 only like a, a five hundred dollars or something, um, you know. But uh, it, it, it's they're, they're just really great to to read. T to be clear, I am not making a point that there's anything wrong with scholarships. Scholarships are wonderful. I, I'm sure each one of these young people is deserving. I'm just saying that for what I see this fund is representing, I would want to assure that a broad base of the citizenry and our athletic programs, our senior programs, have an opportunity to be included, that it doesn't ever stray into the area where it only becomes one kind of a donation. That's all I'm saying don't need to justify scholarships with me. I, I thoroughly appreciate that. Other, other input from other board members? Okay. Are we um, Mr. One, yeah, one, one thought here. Yeah. Um, when we're looking at the second priorities, um, is there, so we have acquisition of town goods, assets, property for athletic, recreational, operating costs. Do we have any kind of prioritization within that, within those so within those bullets. In, in fact, that issue was discussed in my meeting with the two representatives from the Marathon Fund Committee. The feeling was that there was no prioritization. And in fact, in my original draft, those three bullets were numbered. We removed mm -hmm. the numbering and used bullets so that to emphasize that there's no prioritization. I would think that operating costs should be something that would be, you know, kind of fund our baseline if we can. And then, then look at acquisition. Acquisi ac excuse me, acquisition of additional assets. Just my, just thinking out loud here. Yeah. And and, and oh, you know, like I through the chair, one of the things I, that I say when when the uh, marathon fund committee comes with recommendations of what what they're um, asking us to endorse, we have to remember that they are a committee. And um, you know, it, it, we, we shouldn't be mi totally micromanaging that committee also by tying their hands and saying only do this, only do that, because you know, it, again, we should be working with them. Um, you know, we do we do appoint some of them, and, and we should be working with them and not just and really tying the hands on this whole thing. Yeah, we're gonna have to get the overall. Good. Okay. Everybody else set? Okay, Mr. Kamal, you feel you have a good sense of board's recommendations to take to them? E e yes. Okay. <laughs> 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 I'm saying. <laughs> All right, well, good. Then moving on. Here's the fun one. Here's the fun one. 
So next on the agenda, we have the 2019 Boston Marathon Invitational's Random Distribution. The board will hold a public random distribution of marathon invitational entries to qualified applicants for the 2019 Boston Marathon. And uh, the number of numbers we have this year, Mr. Kamalo, is? We have 50 invitational entries uh, issued by the BAA. Uh, we received applications from 26 entities. Uh, and then this evening, I just received an email uh, that is requesting an invitational entry. I just want the board to be aware of that. That email is coming way after the deadline. Um, I'm sorry, what was that from? It was from the HCA and, 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 and ESL. Okay. So of the 26 <coughs> entities that have requested, I took a look through. Um, the only one that I see that may not be Hopkinton based is the the, um, the Semper Fi fund. However, that is one that's been rock solid with us. So I know last year there were talk of there were other towns that were putting requests in, and uh, we wanted to keep it as because we didn't have enough bibs for all the requests. We wanted to keep it to Hopkin and based, and based on what I'm looking at here, uh, minus the uh, Semper Fi fund, which I'm totally 100% in favor of. Uh, I see that all the other businesses seem to be Hopkinton based. Uh, would I be correct in saying that? Yes, you're correct. Um, the, the specific requirement that the board approved was that the organization um, perform public service activities in Hopkinton. Mm -hmm. uh, and this organization does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So I'm just trying to vet it down. Like last year we had a long conversation and they, we could have eliminated some of it by throwing out the people that weren't Hopkinton based. And it uh, doesn't look like we can do that this year. It looks like it's already vetted, so. Yeah. And these are all nonprofit entities? Yeah. Um, there is one application that came in and I understand from Maria, and, and again, Town Hall was closed today. I don't know if uh, Dale, the friends of the Hopkinton have not yet submitted their 541C3 status? C4. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah, C4? It's a C4. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. I, had, I did submit Sponsor. a form that had our C4 number on it. Um, she was looking for something additional. Yes. I spent an hour and a half on the phone with the IRS. I was not <laughs> able to get the form, another form. That's hard to believe. Um, <laughs> that was my second call. With the efficiency. So By which one way, is that again? Brian Hurd, they're watching. <laughs> <laughs> Number 26 is the friend. Just to talk to them. Okay, but it's going to be a 501. It's going to be a nonprofit. It is. Isn't it? Okay, let's go. Yeah. Um, Madam Chair, can I ask a couple questions? So Mr. Kerr, please. You said we got 50 numbers, correct? Yeah, we have 50 numbers. We have 20, 26 requests from the nonprofits and then 24 departmental requests. Right, so that's what I want to get into next. Let's, let's, okay. let's talk about the departmental stuff first, and then we'll see where we go from there. So you're saying the department has 12 and 3 is 22, and the library's 2 is 24. Yeah, yes. Right is that the same as last year? In other words, the 50 goes to 28 real quick. Yeah. If, if we're matching our department distribution from last year. That's, that is the same as last year. If you're yeah. speaking specifically of that distribution, 26 and 24. 28 okay. and 22. This is no, why I'm 26 confused. And 24. Well, 26 and 24, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. Got it. Well, if, if, if I may jump in, one of the things I did looking through this was just working off of first priority is it would be nice if everybody gets something. Every group that wants some access to a number has some access to a number. Um, and there are a couple organizations who have access to numbers without 
the ones we are getting out tonight. Um, the respite center, it says there are 35 given to us by the BAA and 10 additional entries requested to cross points. So I don't know if they'll have 35 or 45, but that group has some. Semper Fi has said they have 15. And I, um, up in the Public Library Foundation has one through the BAA and also uh, the fire department, one of their requests is for respite and one is for Keep Smiling for Abby. So there are a couple of organizations there that have access already. So I picked out going through all the ones that didn't have any access to any numbers. I picked out 24 right there. If you, if you just gave one to each group that didn't have access to anything already. Um, and then I went through the departments, uh, and I think I came up with another 22, which let, gave 46 and left about an extra four. Um, I, I was thinking we should start by well, if, if I may, yeah. Madam Chair, the, I know that the Semper Fi Fund, uh, I, I questioned uh, Michelle about this, that 15 is not, does not necessarily go to the Semper Fi, that, that, that's basically the whole Marine Corps. Mm -hmm. And that's, and that comes from the, the uh, yeah, different group. Yeah, there's a, a several different groups. So I said, you really get 15? And she said, oh, I thought I was supposed to put down what, what come to the, 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 the for the whole entity. So, did, so last year, didn't we take a look at this <coughs> and say, all right, we have, so this year, for example, we have 50 bibs to give out. We have 24 departmental requests. We have 26 requests. Some have requested two, uh, but 26. 27 if we have HCA in there. Right, but they missed the deadline. Okay, but, all right, we'll cover that later. So. Couldn't this whole thing that would be cut real short there. by saying, follow the same practice that we did last year and give everybody one, give the departments what they want, 50-50, done, move on? That's the safest way to do it. Couldn't we do that? Oh, it certainly add up, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, make a motion. So can I, I'd like to make a motion to, if I may, to um, allot one bib to each of the 26 entities that have applied and um, the remaining 24 bibs that we have would go to the departmental requests. Uh, 12 to the police, three to fire, two to senior center, five to marathon committee, and two to the public library. Second. Any further discussion? Madam Chair. So the HCA ESL came in late, correct? Correct. Oh. How late? It wasn't a matter of minutes, right? It was, it was, it was, it was months. Just it was due, no, it was due what? November? What was the deadline date? 21st. So did they, did they have one last year? They did, I believe. I can check. I believe they did. And is there any town department that's higher this year than last year? No. They're all the same. Yes. In the same departments. Well, except that Do we the fire department, one of the ones they're requesting is for is Keith Smiling for Abby, who are also requesting one through us. Right, which we did last year. But I mean, so they're year. getting two, whereas all these other entities are, are only getting one. I mean, you could, you could take that one and give it to HCA and that way they'd each get one instead of one getting two and the other getting nothing. But, but we, can't, we, we, we can't tell the fire department what to do with theirs though. It's just because they're being honest to tell us up front who they're giving it to. Yeah, I, I, we've done that for a few years now with the Keep Smiling for Abby. I wouldn't want to change that. No, I I'm not trying to throw a monkey in the ranch here to get this to done. Find a way no, I understand. To do the, I understand. the HCA ESL is a huge part of hockey. It team. is. It does yep. a fabulous it job. Um, it's unfortunate they were late, but you know they're like the rest of us. We're all busy doing a million different things. But I'm just trying to see if there's a place where we could find one for them. But 
to take one from somebody. That's that's um, saying. I mean, I know what the police does with the numbers. They need them to get help. And yeah. It's a way to sort of bargain a little bit. Ask the police if they yeah. have enough to win. Either that, or the only, again, the only reason I was su suggesting keep smiling for Abby is Live for Evan will be getting one. Um, I, I see those as sort of similar organizations. They're both Hopkinton based. They're both for a particular mm -hmm. ailment. They both are memorializing young people, young Hopkinton people who you know tragically passed early. Um, you know, if we do this the way we are, the Abbey Foundation will get two, and Evan will get one. And we need the same. We'd like to have one more to give to HCA. So if you if you did it that way, both groups would be getting one. And HCA would get one. So I, I struggle with taking away fundraising opportunities for two young people where, whom we lost. Mm -hmm. yeah. And these efforts are on behalf of the, their name to carry on their good, their good work in their lives. Um, so I, I don't see a way out here. I think it is what it is for this year. And we'll just well, encourage everybody to get in here next year. Later. But that way, is there a way to give two to live for Evan? Because Evan's asked for two. Yeah, Evan ask hasn't asked for two. Evan's asked for one, and the no, fire department's no, giving a second no, one away. Evan's asked for two. Everybody asked for oh, yeah, everybody's everybody's getting one. Yeah, yeah. And that well, way, you know, Abby will five. end up yeah. getting two, and Evan will get one. So, and, and everybody else one I don't want to sound, I, think don't I don't want it to, to come out yeah. cold that I'm saying you missed the deadline, you're out. I'm just saying that. You missed the deadline. <laughs> I mean, they did. And I'm very much, like Mr. Hurst said, I'm very much for the HCA and, and ESL. It, it, it's a great organization. Um, but, all right, I think we have a motion. I'll have, I'm ready Mr. to Kamala, Kamala, looks like he's trying to say something. Um, over the years, the I entities that show up at town hall with such requests uh, after the fact, and what we normally do is we go back into our network and see if we can help them. I think we can do the same for the HCA. Okay, good. Okay, so we'll leave the HCA out for the present yeah. time and work with the 26 who've applied and the 24 departmental requests and see if after the fact there can be something done through a different channel yes. for HCA. Awesome. Yeah. I think that's great. And a word to other organizations that Deadline's the deadline is a rule. I mean, if, it's, if it keeps occurring, then we have a problem. Good. Okay, I believe the motion was made and seconded. Not? Okay, motion has been made and seconded to grant um, one of, let me see if I have the motion document here that said it the way you wanted me to say it. No, that's not it. Here, here it is. Okay, I request a motion to distribute 24 entries to town departments as follows. Uh, police department is 12, fire department is 3. That was all in the motion. Yeah, there, no, there, there actually, we already, there already is one motion on the table. So we either have to vote that one up or down before we do one. Yeah, which was 24 and 26. Okay. 24 and 26. So then and I don't I, need to. I broke it out as, as requested. Okay. All right. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 And opposed, <laughs> that's unanimous. All right. So we don't need we don't need to go through all these things. Okay. Good. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. Good thing the math came out this yeah. time. It's I not always that. Right it's not always right. that easy. Unfortunately. All right. You want to do something on trees? Okay. Okay. Um, next on the agenda is tree management in the town. This is kind of an ongoing discussion. John Catino will review the need for tree management in town. Mr. Catino, take it away. Thank you very Thank much. You Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. I know. No, no, no. <laughs> I thought this was table. I had not seen any of you. Mm -hmm. No. Uh, I'm, 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 I'
Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Okay. Do you want to speak, Russia? Yes. Please. Thank you. So, um, yeah, this is one of the uh, three third. This is one of the third rails that we we don't usually like to talk about trees, trash, and trails, but um, it, it's important. You know, it. You know, it, as important as as tree management is, and. Um, and roadway management actually is, it, but it, it has to continue to be as part of an overall um, DPW strategic plan. Now, it, it's something that we've been talking about for uh, several months, and, and I'm sure that uh, um, Mr. Kamalo and uh, Mr. Westerling will, will bring that forward in, in the near future. Um, but um, a municipality is responsible for providing safe passage for our, for our mobile society. And from time to time, this includes work on the roadside or right-of-way tree. Sometimes tree work must be done in emergency situations. Sometimes the work is performed as part of an ongoing annual maintenance. And sometimes, if budgets allow, the work is contracted. Some pitfalls and problems are associated with the right-of-way tree care. But following some common sense tips from professional arborists, our, our town can improve its roadside tree maintenance program and avoid these problems. Some people ask why to main, why maintain roadside trees? To uh, secure public safety and redu reduce potential liability. The prime directive for municipal officials is to secure the health, safety, and welfare of the citizens. And this applies when dealing with the right-of-way trees. Low-hanging branches, diseased or dead trees and limbs, and trees too close to the road can, can become hazardous to the traveling public. Keeping municipal employees safe while working on roads is a prime concern also. You know, we, we really have to continue to promote um, tree health care. We also have to um, take care in making sure that the sides of the roads are taken care of. You know, if, if we have some very narrow roads and there are many areas of town that don't have sidewalks. And during the summer, the, it, the, the um, yeah. soft shoulders are covered with uh, uh, poison ivy, poison oak, poison sumac, and uh, if you're riding a bike or walking or walking a dog and, and two cars come by, you're forced to jump into the poison ivy. So this is stuff that, that I know years ago that we took care of, and I just wanted to, want to uh, um, have the citizens of the town knowing that we are talking about it again and that uh, we are taking it seriously, and it really should be part of a, um, of a strategic plan going forward. So... With that, Mr. Regan, you've, you've, you've been really helping us out on, on, on uh, uh, some guidance. You know, and, and, and I did a lot of research. Actually, uh, right next to us, we have um, Grafton as a, as a great um, um, uh, roadside tree management plan. And then uh, the uh, uh, Massachusetts Department of uh, Transportation, Texas Department of Transportation has a really great, uh, great outline for, for stuff that we can, we can look at. And, and we even have Vancouver. And we have uh, London in here, but they they actually have, they, they they clear out their trees at 16 feet six inches, because they have to accommodate the double decker buses. Most of our municipalities are 16 feet or some 14 feet uh, clearance over the roads, so that uh, when a uh, a truck goes underneath, that they don't break off limbs and and have them drop on the car behind them, like happened to me over the summer, which is why I'm a, why I'm pushing this a lot. You've covered all the bases, John. That's great. I can go. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Let me go fast here, people. I, I won't tie you up. We'll go through this and I'll expand on a couple of these things here. Advantages of a hop getting tree department. Be proactive, not reactive, which right now it's all we are is reactive. When something happens, we go out, talk to fire department. They're proactive. Fire prevention. We need to do the same thing. John cutting back, and the sidewalks too. There are some places in town where you can't see sidewalks. Nobody's maintaining them, so people are walking on the roads. I don't know, I think we should save money on sidewalks, period. The 16 foot clearance, I think that's, that's what's recommended pretty much. The lines of sight at your intersections and sharp curves when the foliage is on the trees, you're going around a sharp bend, somebody's walking and you're walking into traffic, that's what we're always taught. I've nearly clipped a few myself, and I'm not a fast driver. I mean, all of a sudden, they're there, and you have to move quickly. 
the dead, poorly structured, and excessively leaning trees. They didn't get the dead trees. I know everybody acknowledges, and we've had some with the gypsy moth, the winter moth, and the drought, and roadside chemicals, or road chemicals, and all that jazz. But we have a lot more coming down the road. And before I go any further, too, I want to put a, I guess you call it a shout out, to Eversource. I've been in this business going pretty near 50 years now. I can't believe that. But this is the most that I've ever seen Eversource take on. We've got two or three contractors in town. I talked to the arborist, um, Chris Gonzalez, yesterday, asking him for an approximate figure. They have spent 100000 on line clearing, which really keeps the power on in good weather. That's why they trim the wires, trim the limbs around the wires. They spent a quarter of a million so far on tree removals. And that's not one penny to us. And they still have another buck and a half left in the budget. So they're going to be spending a half a million dollars, which I've never thought I'd live to see that day. And they're doing, they got very professional crews doing this job. They're doing a great job. And uh, just ge general pruning as well, people, going down the road, pruning these trees up. Not only removal, but pruning. You've got some dead up there, 60 feet up, and an object gains its own unit of weight for every foot it falls, plus 10. Hits the ground, it hits with a force. Assistant keeping the trails open. Mike liked that one there. Try to help out with keeping all of our trails that we're developing around town. Street lights. We have some street lights up there that are illuminating leaves, and that's it. How the tree department do that? You go up in your bucket and you cut around them. Again, maintenance. And replacing burned light bulbs. I've done several of those and Bobby Butler was around. And I said to Brandon, you do that. You don't send anybody a bill for replacing one light bulb. You keep stuff like this in town. That's how you save a buck. Eventually combining, and Brandon, we talked about this, a tree, park, and cemetery department. Long ways down the road, I grant you that, but it can be done. And John's favorite, the Poison Ivy Control Program. That will take years to knock it down. It is, it is up three or four feet. If you're out walking or running by, you know, you've got to get out of the way. You better hope you don't have a terrible allergy to Poison Ivy. It's three and four feet. It takes years to bring the layers down. We had it done, so when I was tree warden, and then we just couldn't do it anymore. Incidentals, putting up and taking down flags and banners. My wife wanted to mention that one. It really does not look great to see our town employees standing on a stepladder in the back of a pickup truck, putting up flags. That's an invitation for a comp claim right there. That's insane. We can do better than that, people. Assisting the highway department with snow removal operations. How does the tree department do that when you have a big snowstorm? It isn't always damaging like it is up country right now or like we had last March. Are the DPW, you park, and it's around town Framingham, you park your trucks, and you assist the DPW with plowing, salting, sanding, whatever they need. It is a joint effort, simple as that. What, I left my readers back there. What does a tree department consist of? Basically a working foreman, slash assistant tree warden. Mass General Law allows a tree warden to appoint an assistant tree warden with pretty much the same powers he has to make decisions on the spot, as opposed to having to contact the tree warden for every single thing you get done. This eliminates a lot of bureaucracy. At least three additional personnel. Now that sounds like a lot, but to make a crew efficient, at least two, hopefully three. And the summer help. This summer help would be great to clear the sides of the road. That's not a lot of skill needed. Equipment needed. Capital purchases would include, and I know we're going off the rails here on this one, but eventually, a 75-foot bucket truck. Our trees haven't gotten any shorter over the years. I started off with a 55, and now you need 75. They're just getting taller. And these hangers, if you notice, every once in a while, you'll see one on the side of the road. That These were the ones that broke off back in March, and they're just working their way down. You've got to be able to reach them. A log truck, a little six-wheel log truck to pick up the mess that you make, and a chip truck to, to chip into. This is what a little company like mine has. It works very nicely. We have a chipper, it is old, Mike made a note over here, 25 years old, but it hasn't gotten a lot of use, it really hasn't. And I bought a stump grinder for the time when I was tree warden there, and that, that's, that's in pretty good shape. Equipment to control poison ivy, that's a big thing, that can be done in-house. If people take their pesticide tests, get their licenses, that can be done here, and that will be an ongoing thing. And, of course, the equipment would be the appropriate tree tool saws and all that. Again, we're not going to talk about money before that. We're not even anywhere near that yet. 
just trying to get something, and I, I know that Brendan has got something in the works already. But Mike and Peter, I guess Peter didn't make it. Peter Mezzet, you can pass that on about doing the nursery and the planting, Mike. Okay. I had a discussion with Peter Mezzet today, and um, he's very interested in cooperating with giving uh, me access to some land to plant out some trees so we could use it in a two different um, ways of using it is growing it or storaging storage uh, that would be healing them in and then the other thing is to let them grow if it's some kind of damage or something to put it in a holding area so Peter is very very interested in um, our cooperating with us in um, working towards a better tree town uh, aesthetics. So it would be planting uh, and, and aesthetics and um, perhaps reviewing the uh, plans on the types of trees the builders would plant. Um, we've had issues with that type of thing. And um, then the, um, the techniques for planting. Uh, a lot of times they just plant them too deep and they die. And the way you see that is the top branches are dead because they're trying to push out another set of roots. Um, so constantly you see street trees dead on the top. It's because they're planted too deep. So Peter mentioned um, maybe a process of inspecting that and making sure good trees go in, the proper tree goes in, and it's planted the proper way. That's things that are down the line after we get established. Peter is willing to, they have land up on Wilson Street. Yeah. And when we talked about using some of uh, Joe Pratt's land for a nursery, I forget who brought that up, and I was standing with Peter at the nursery, and Peter said, I have 20 acres of land up on Wilson Street, the town's happy to use. In a joint effort, it would benefit both of us. It's been planted before, the irrigation is here, the electrical is here, he's willing to go all in with this to help us out. In other words, when I was tree warden, I took all down a lot of trees that these builders planted because they were inferior, but they, satisfied the plantable requirements of a tree every 40 feet, which I would really love to review that. That's a waste of time. You should develop a money, uh, uh, a price on per tree to be planted and put it into a tree planting account and let the tree warden or the assistant tree warden determine what should go where. Because we're wasting a lot of money planting trees that have no business being there. They could, other parts of town, it doesn't have to be in that subdivision. It can be elsewhere in town. Some of these subdivisions are going right through the woods. You don't need to replant, but we could use it someplace else. And the requirement, I think, is every 40 feet. It should be, I believe. No, I thought you were, oh, anyway, it is. So, Regardless, something like that anyway. So we're constantly cutting down dead trees um, and not replacing them. There used to be a lot more shade in, in town. A lot fewer people. Well, we have some people then. <laughs> so, there's still standing dead trees right now. Standing dead tree up at the water towers and a standing dead tree down at uh, the common. Uh, and when, many others. When we accept the open spaces, which is always great, we also accept, unfortunately, the responsibility and the liability of adjoining neighbors trees and I got called when I was tree warden. Reed Park was a great one, way in the woods someplace. Deadwind Well the Mass General Law on Tree Warden reads the public way, the traveled way, verbatim. That's really all we have to take care of unless like Park Department says we you help us out on the common. But by law that's all the tree warden is responsible for. And of course we go way beyond that. But that takes money and that takes time. Again something that could be done and helps maintain the parks. Uh, very easy to trails. Just a, a lot can be done to get something going with this. I think they're being interested in people doing it. Some of the, the highway guys are interested in learning the nuances of tree work, if you will. And, and it'd be great. We did have some good people down there. Then 
We've kind of lost some of them. Whatever. That's it. End. Yeah, I missed. I missed the edict. By the way, when did the selectmen say we're joining Brothers of the Brush? Oh, Clay, you're next. You're the only one. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> it won't happen. Is this going to happen for the 350th? you got a long way to go. Right? I think you may uh, be putting the forest show. before the trees. <laughs> <laughs> so, Mr. Herr, we have some input here. Does Mass General Law require that the tree warden be a separate entity from the DPW? Or no. can you have a tree warden inside a DPW? Or someone designated as a tree warden inside. He can wear two hats. Yeah. Well, right now it's yeah. John Westerland yeah. yeah. is doing it. He's doing he it. He is the tree warden. Yes. Okay. So why would we have to have a, a separate tree department? Why couldn't we just charge the DPW with tree management and outline with the expertise of others what that work should entail? And if that requires two additional people plus two others that are in the department now to go help do the work with those two. I mean, adding three or four people to a town budget uh, is going to be met with some resistance. I Just agree. Not only here, but I, at least, you know, town-wide. But if we were to, to think about adding responsibility to the DPW with some staffing to help and a trucker, I mean, we can figure out the asset piece too. Um, maybe that would be a way to go instead. I guess my thing is I'm offered this. I think it's a big safety issue in town. Uh, I've had some tree issues at the house and as a runner, I've had things fall on my head plenty of times, which can explain a few things probably, but, um, a new department, I would not support us managing our trees and charging the DPW or some other entity, whichever that, whoever that is in town to manage the trees and then give them the resources they need to get it done. I would support. And I see John walk in. Yeah. If I may, to the chair. We got to call it. And, and that's John? why. And that's why I started it off with that. The most important thing is to work through the DPW, see their strategic plan, where they where they try and fit this in. You know, in, in the last in the last like 14 months, there have been three major letter to the letter to the editors in in, in the paper, where people really are screaming for for some tree management. And especially after the storms last year, where where many of us were out of power for four days, and um, it, it gets tough, and it, and 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 it's dangerous, um, and it's just you know it's something that that uh, s slowly evolves. You know, we we it's okay. What's up? It's it's what happened to us with our sidewalks and other things, and and you know people do it at their homes with maintenance or with their cars. You don't take care of it, and it's like, oh, so I'll put off an oil change, and then you, you put it off, put it off, and so we put off with the, you know, uh, doing some tree trimming. We put off taking care of the uh, with the uh, uh, poison ivy, and then it just starts growing on us, and all of a sudden it's a it's a huge problem, and so we really have to get into looking at some of this maintenance, how it happens, you know, that that believe that that as you said, leave it up to the professionals to figure out how we can get it done. But we really do have to start putting this in as one of our priorities um, and, and work it into our budget. You know, I realize it's a big pill to swallow, don't get me wrong. But you need a dedicated tree department. You don't need a part time. And within the DPW, those guys are, you got 110 miles of road, man. And we don't have half the people that we need down there. We were short, I think John will tell you, we were short and I talked to Mike during this last storm. A couple of guys are out, one guy's got a rotator cuff, a couple of guys are on vacation, some equipment didn't come back. Luckily, it wasn't a big storm. I think John can speak to that. And I think the guys covered it well. But you need, what during that storm, we had plowing and we had trees down everywhere. You didn't have enough people to, to deal with that. We had to plow up to the tree and go around and do something else. We need a tree department to come out and take care of that while the highway guys deal with the storm. Now, are they going to happen a lot? They say they are, I don't know. But it's good to have a separate department, it really is, so they can focus on that. And like I said, when something, the department needs extra people, then you go and you help the DPW or the water department, whatever, whatever's available. Yeah, I understand what you're saying, Brian, yeah, absolutely. So my background, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Mr. Bolson, go ahead. My background is, uh, um, I worked at Western Nurseries 
I don't know, seven or eight years, and then I did 20 years, I worked at um, Cedar Lawn Tree Service. Most of the arborists, well, all of them had college degrees. Most of them were four-year degrees in arboriculture. Um, it's, when you're talking about dead trees, okay, you don't have to know all that stuff. But there is a lot of other stuff, the he EHAP, with the wires overhead, they all have certifications on that. Electrical hazard awareness program. Yeah, yeah. and um, you 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 came from uh, UMass, right? Nichols, that's a yeah. Nichols. Business degree in forestry. I can count trees really well. Yeah. <laughs> so um, uh, there's a lot of training, a lot of certi uh, training. Um, Certificates, ongoing safety programs, safety programs, certifications. There's a long, long list of it uh, that typically the person needs to be dedicated to trees. A green person. I don't disagree at all with all the things you've pointed out and all the needs, and I think it would be just a great thing if we as a town could do all that and you know what you've laid out that we could the town could do it up brown um, but you know I, I coming right now I, I agree with mr. her for where we are at this particular time we haven't started talking too much about the budget process but that is going to be happening and you know you've all probably read in the paper some of the real challenges right now with the explosion in the schools and the explosion in that department and um, the new growth is is less and and the projections are down um, and I just it's gonna be a tough budget year and it's gonna be a couple of tough budget years from what we can see and um, you know, all this stuff costs money. I would be interested to see some costs applied yeah, to these step. ideas. Yep. Yep. Um, but the the creation at this time of entire new bureaucracy with benefits and, and pensions and all the rest that goes with it, um, I think it's a really tough ask right now. Um, I was noticing, pull back an email that was sent just a couple weeks ago, about some of the tree removal that was done and is being done in the town through Eversource, just kind of shows some numbers. Um, the town recently removed seven trees for $12,800 for an average cost of $1,800 per tree. Um, Eversource is going to be taking out 145 dead trees for the town, ranging from six inches to more than 36 inches. The average cost multiplied by the 145 trees to be removed equals $261,000. In summation, 145 town trees are being removed at no cost to the town, savings of approximately $261,000. So, you know, so that's what, what it costs to take down trees, um, j just, just taking down the trees. Um, you know, whether we could somehow scale this back in a way that we had a kind of a middle ground of some things that we could look to do, whether this type of tree removal could be a, a capital request and we had a poison ivy removal program and team up with more with the DPW. I don't know. I, I, I'm not arguing that the need is there. I, I just, as Mr. Hur says, I can't see a whole creation of a new department no, in right this away, budget no. I'm looking down the road, Claire. Little by little, I'm trying to lay the grass what we've been doing now for our third time up here. Yeah. Trying to lay the groundwork to get something going. Start somewhere. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I get that you have to have focus in, in any business, or any operation. You need to have focus, people doing focus things. Um, and, and the <coughs> idea of a new department and additional people, and then they're going to want, you know, administrative help and before you know it, you got 10 people yeah. in a new department, and that's 10 OPEB numbers, yeah. and that's 10 more, that's you know, bazillions of dollars and all kinds yeah. of liability down the road. But 
the idea of focus makes sense. So maybe you start with, quote, a new department of one. And that new department of one is a dedicated tree warden who either reports to the town manager or to the director, director of public works, probably the director of public works. And that person has to draw on the labor and coordinate with the DPW to get the additional help to make things happen. But that person's job is tree management and tree safety in Hockington. And then we can go from there. But, you know, I'm just looking forward to two months from now or three months from now. I shouldn't say looking forward. But when we get three months from now and we're sitting in this room with our colleagues from the school committee yep. and there's 800 new kids, literally some crazy number like that, and millions of dollars of additional need there. Yep. And then all kinds of other money as a result of that needed for public safety uh, because of the growing population and et cetera. You know, three or four people in my head, that's three or 400 grand, all in, fully loaded with salaries, benefits, expenses, trucks, cars, yada, yada, yada. So it's a lot of money. So maybe one person, a new department, because we got to get focused, because we live in the forest out here. But then the labor piece of that. Is somehow blended with the DPW team. <clears throat> so, if I may, I first of all, I want to thank Joe for coming up and putting all this legwork into this. This has absolutely this doesn't this doesn't assist Joe or his business. It actually is detrimental to his business because if he's working on stuff like this, it precludes him from doing a lot of the work. So, what people need to understand is that people like Joe Regan, Mike Bolson, the Mezzet family, they're in this for Hopkinton, and they're longtime Hopkinton people. And this town, we're losing longtime Hopkinton people. So people that come in for 10 years and leave, they don't get that there was the Cook Cumlins, the Bob Bartlett's, the Docky Haywards, the, the, the people like that, that that really are, are into this town for the town and not for themselves. Um, the, and I understand what you're saying, and, and I don't think that in this budget crisis that we're in right now, that we can justify putting a 10 person department together and call it the tree department or buy green trucks and letter them up. And I don't think that that's what anyone wants. I think that, yeah, the schools, they're having a boom, and we are going to have to fund that. How much is it going to cost if a town-owned trees, if a town -owned tree falls on a bus stop and kills three kids? How much is that going to cost? Really. God forbid. But how much is it going to cost? There's, there are trees all over the place that need to come down. And is it cheaper to train three or four of our existing staff, go out and have them get certified, and procure, procure the, uh, the equipment and have them start going out um, and, and hitting some of the hardest spots, some of the most dangerous spots? Or is it cheaper to call a Joe Regan, American Climbers, a, a Lewis Tree, who, whoever goes out there and charge the 1800 bucks a tree? It's not cheaper to hire these companies to come in and, and, uh, and cut these trees down. Uh, so, I think that we do need to take a very serious look at this. I don't think that in our budget uh, situation that we have now that we can afford to start a tree company. I would love to start a tree slash parks department. I would love it, but realistically, it's not going to happen. Um, but seriously, you have to think about, like, I, I speak to people all the time. People think I'm anti-schools, and then when I tell them that I'm not anti-schools and I explain to them why, they understand. And then I'll get anti-fire department, anti-police, no matter what, and if, you, if you walk on water, they'll say it's because you can't swim. So yeah, we do need the teachers, we do. But if we put 200 more teachers on, and then we have to lay off a couple of cops, now we have a narcotic problem, an opioid problem, and then we don't have an ambulance to go and take care of the people. And if the Lord forbid, if it snows, we don't even have plows to plow the snow, but we'll have 400 more teachers. Or vice versa, if we put it all towards police and to the opioid, Process, uh, crisis, then we're not going to have enough teachers to run the schools and we're going to have 45 kids. And so there's, there's pluses and minus and, and, and checks and balances. Um, and I do think that we do need to, to attack some of this. And, and uh, you know, we will 
figure out a way to get it done. And, and I know, Joe, I know that you're not coming up here saying we need to have a, a, a tree department put in, but it's something that we seriously <coughs> need to look at. And it, I totally am, am in your favor, and, and I do believe that that's the case. Um, you know, like you said, the sidewalks. You walk down Pleasant Street, you got to almost walk on Pleasant Street to, to go through some of the sidewalks. My antenna broke off my truck the other day driving down the street because there was some overbrush um, that that came down and hit the hit the uh, antenna. So, um, so I, I think that we do need to look at it um, realistically, and I think that it we're, it's a wonderful asset to have someone like you as passionate as you are and as knowledgeable as you are, which I know that you probably don't get that compliment very often. Uh, Especially from my wife. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I would love to work with you and try to figure out, put our heads together yeah. and figure out what we can do and, and what our next step is within the restraints of our budget and our manpower. If I may through the chair. Yes. Yeah, I, I, I see this as a mindset change. You know, we, we have the schools that, that, that are going to hit us in, in a couple of weeks with a lot of new students. Yeah, and, and, and the fire and the police you know, as, as first responders. But we have to think of the DPW department as public safety. That's the problem. We just think of them as when everything's going well, nobody thinks about DPW. But they are public safety. If they don't plow the roads, fire trucks don't get there. The police cars don't get there. Kids don't get to school. So we've got to start thinking of the DPW as also public safety. And this and these, this these, this tree issue, it's, you know, is part of public safety, you know, and and you know, be, because it's a it's a quiet department, everything goes well, at the at every every budget season, we cut DPW. It's like, well, they're not cops, they're not ambulance, they're not schools. Schools have have a school have a have a school committee that that can that can um, uh, help them out, but you know, who helps out the DPW? You know, they, they needed it. They needed a a, a um, a truck last year, it's like, well, you know, we can get this 60,000, we can put someplace else. But this is the stuff, we have to think of them as public safety because without them, there is no public safety. Through the chair. I mean, I think everything that we're all saying makes sense. We know that this is a problem that needs to be dealt with and we also know that there's budget constraints that are gonna prevent it. But I think you're right when you say, let's lay the groundwork now, let's start thinking about this. And I think having uh, Brian's suggestion of having you know one person designated to deal with trees, maybe the maybe the uh, what we task that person with is coming up with a strategic plan for how we're going to attack this, um, and and you know, how we'll go about dealing with all the trees um, and the poison ivy issue and and everything else, but um, you know as we sit here talking about none of us have arborist degrees and we've just heard that you know there are four-year degree programs I mean, maybe maybe that's what we should be doing is delegating this responsibility to somebody who is well versed in the subject um, definitely agree and and kind of let that person start moving it forward not in a new tree department now but a new tree department or a mechanism for dealing with this later it sounds like everyone's on the same good yeah same plane what about did my job. if the DPW were to hire a new person and he had uh, horticulture experience, he'd he say he was an arborist, um, mass arborist certification. That would be a criteria to get on the department. Well, I think that's what Brian was talking about, yeah. yeah. Starting with morning, yeah. yeah. Well, the next, the next new hire. I so see our, our DPW director, Mr. Westerling, is there. Do you, and he's serving as our tree warden now. He's been a tree warden in other towns. Do you have any thoughts or input on this, Mr. Westerling, or just want to listen? <laughs> not, not, I don't mean to put you on the spot. I just wondered if you wanted to be included in the discussion at all. Madam Chair, I'm happy to put my thoughts. Please. Talk. And for the record, I'm always happy to put him on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> You'll do it. Thank you, Jim. Good evening. Through the chair, thanks to, uh, to Joe and to Mike for coming forward with this idea, and uh, thanks to you all for your support of the DPW and the, the work that we do. Uh, we do have a budget for tree removal. It is only $40,000. Uh, we've had to, to cut that back. Um, we, we sought more last year, but we had to cut it back due to the budget constraints. 
Um, and that gets us the ability to remove maybe 25 trees. With 110 miles of road with trees on both sides, that's 220 miles worth of tree-lined roads. Mm -hmm. Uh, thanks to our partners at Eversource, we are getting quite a few trees removed that are saving us some quarter million dollars. Um, we did have a tree warden who uh, passed away, was it two years ago now? Yeah, I can't believe it. Um, that worked per diem, and any time there was an issue, we would call Paul, uh, who would go out and look at the trees and would then contract for tree removal work. Uh, we have been looking in our strategic plan, we have been looking at the concept of bringing in um, a tree removal division, if you will, uh, but that's two full-time employees minimum. That's a bucket truck, which is $170,000, um, and that comes along with the possibility of back injuries, slip and fall injuries, it's very dangerous work. Um, so what we've been relying on is the $40,000 that we have that when, when a dangerous tree is brought to my attention as the acting tree warden, I immediately call for it to be removed. Uh, we can't have that liability and risk on, on, the, on the community. Um, so, so that's where we are. We are looking at the possibility, uh, but it will bring added cost to the operation of the department. May I say that when I was talking to the Adverse yesterday, whose name you gave me there, uh, Gonzalez, Chris mm -hmm. Gonzalez. Mm -hmm. Ever he sources. spoke very highly of working with this guy. He said, it's a pleasure to work with. That's why we're getting so much done. Thank That's you. That's why we're getting so much done, yep. All right. So Madam Chair, would it make sense for, as because we are almost in full swing here with the budget season, but would it make sense for the Board of Selectmen through the town manager to suggest the DPW director that as part of his submission for his budget this year, that this discussion be one, remembered, and two, acted on in some manner as you present a budget to us because we always want to know what the adders are, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we can see then what kind of impact we're looking at and with whatever that impact is, budget-wise, what do we get for that impact? Like what's going to happen as a result of that? And then we can kind of take it from there. I mean. So, to clarify, what are you suggesting he include in his budget? Um, I'm not quite sure what you're asking. I don't know if we should it. I think we should leave it up to him. Because if he's only got, if it, sorry, to, to, to Yeah, I, I'm just not quite sure well, what. You know, if he's only going to get 40000 now, yeah. what could he do? You know, just to have him come back to us and say, you know. We his already, number's already in, I believe, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So, so the budget number's already in. Okay. So and far be it from any of us to try to, you know, get involved in the day-to-day -day operation, but um, I guess to kind of be cognizant moving forward, um, you know, if you are looking to put a guy on, then maybe think about, you know, if, if we can, if you can say one of the prerequisites is to have a four-year arborist degree, and if you can find someone that wants to come and apply to work for you with that, then, you know, maybe that would be great, but it's, I'm, I'm not trying to, to get involved with your day-to-day -day operation. Use so bucket, so use bucket truck. How about this idea, though, if I could? Are there people out in the marketplace that are 1099 contractors that would work for multiple municipalities and be a tree warden, be like a private tree warden, if you will, and have one person who, I don't know, Ashland, maybe Ashland's got a tree warden that also was the tree warden for Southboro, and... They're paid, you know, by each of the communities, and some kind. It's 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 somebody we could get focus on. It wouldn't cost us two hundred fifty grand, and it could start the process that we need to go down a path for um, sooner than later. I, I don't know. I'm just like our gas and electric inspectors. I but but like I, our town council. Our town council uh, is our town council. Our town council is town council for about ten other communities. Maybe not that many, but he works for other communities. He's at our town meeting for a week. Next week he's at another town meeting, but he's our town council. We could have a tree warden maybe doing the same thing. I don't know. I'm just Mr. Kamal and I are chatting, and maybe that's an idea. I, I, I'm, I'm not quite understanding what you're looking for, though, because um, it appears that what we need is to get work done. There's stuff that needs to be done. Mr. Westerling is serving as our tree, tree warden. He's been a tree warden before. Um, I mean, maybe he doesn't have an arborist degree, but I'm not sure it's it's the tree warden position that's making the difference. It's it's that there's actual physical work that's not getting done. Um, I don't think it's for want of a tree warden because 
Mm. We do have a tree warden. Yeah, yeah a, a tree warden is not going to. I mean, keep the he's tree not down. like John Westerling as with his tree warden hat on. Is not going to go to Mike Manser and say, "I want someone in a bucket truck to go up and cut around those lines." Those people that are going to go up and cut around those lines or around those street lights have to be trained. That's what we need. So, it's not sure it's Mass General Law or each town must have a tree warden. Dictated okay, so 1910, yes. you have to have one. I don't yeah. know if you could split the split the dues. That's a good question. But through the chair, Mr. Westerling. Thank you. Um, we the the former tree warden that we had before he passed was per diem. Mm -hmm. So we were paying him for uh, whether he worked an hour or 100 hours during the month. So it would be a similar type thing where we would share the services and we would pay per diem on a monthly basis. So that's, that's a, a model that the town is familiar with. And I'm happy to put forward through to the town manager's office, even though the budget numbers were already in, some sort of a strategic initiative which would show two options. One would be to what would it cost to bring on two full-time employees with a bucket truck and all the necessary equipment? Uh, and what would it cost to uh, budget the, the, the services that we put out to private tree companies? What would it look like to have an, an adequate tree removal budget without adding any full-time employees? Excuse me, if I may, we keep talking about tree removal, but one of the main things that, that I'm talking about is maintenance. Getting that canopy cut, just like just like Mr. Tedstone was just mm -hmm. talking about, driving down Pleasant Street. One, if, if you if you're in a pickup truck or, or any large SUV, you've got to drive in the middle of the road, or you hit those trees on the side. Yeah. You know, going down going down um, uh, Elizabeth Road, the, the those trees are about nine feet, and it's the same thing when when there's just a little bit of snow on them. You've got to drive. Oh, you've got to drive. You're doing the uh, S curves all over the place to get around those trees. So I'm just talking about. You know, we also we keep just talking about tree removal, but there has to be some maintenance over the road so that we can comply with the standards. Mm -hmm. um, I happened to see Mr. Mesut came in. I didn't know Peter. Did you come for this discussion, or is there anything you want to contribute? I don't mean yeah, to push you on the spot. Yeah, you know, you guys are going to start so early. Pete, you want to Okay. All right. So, so I don't know what you guys have discussed, so I can't. So, really so Pete, um, Mr. Bolson came up and told us about that you offered to, to help us out with some land, you know, not donating, but letting us use some land down on Wilson Street, and it's very much appreciated and, and, and working with us for the plantings and things like that. So, um, you know, thank you very much for that for that generous and gracious offer. Uh, and, and that's basically where we stand there with you. So thanks. <laughs> we haven't decided on, on what we're going to do, but uh, right. you need to know that, that uh, he did present it. Uh, it's, it's awesome. It's not out of character. It's, it's something that we almost expect from you to do, is, is to do stuff like that. And we appreciate it. So thank you. All right. If there are no further board comments, then what we're asking for the short term is for Mr. Westerling to maybe pull together some some budget numbers to have a look at for what some of these added services might cost us. Is that what we would agree upon? Sure. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you now, were you? Thank you all. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. much. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. You did a good job considering you were kind of put on short notice there. Uh, <coughs> town manager's report. Uh, Mr. Kamalo, I believe you're going to address the Trails Coordinating Committee update and anything else. Y yes. Um, in, in fact, I have. I have a. Yes, I have a couple points on, on, on this item. The first being, uh, Elena and I met with the chairs of the Planning Board, the Conservation Commission, uh, the chair of the Open Space Committee um, was not able to, to join us for that meeting. Um, what, what we gathered from that discussion with the representatives, or with the chairs of the Planning Board and the Conservation Commission is that they would like to have more time to discuss the draft charge with us. I know the board had given us the deadline of 
today uh, to present something to the board. Yes, we do have a draft, but I want to share with you that we had a very productive conversation with the chairs of the Planning Board and the Conservation Commission. They pointed out some issues that we would like to discuss further with them. Um, and uh, Elaine, I don't recall if we've actually scheduled our follow-up meeting, but they did ask that we schedule a follow-up meeting with them. So my request tonight is um, if the board could grant us more time to review this with the uh, Planning Board, Conservation Commission, as well as the Chair of the Open Space um, Preservation Commission. How much time are you looking for? And what about trails? Why aren't they, why aren't they, they, they involved? This, yeah, no, this, this is about trails. No, why isn't, they, why isn't Upper Charles part of that group and, uh, and, and maybe the, uh, the, the other, <coughs> other Friends of the Trails or whatever it is, uh, the, the other Trails Club? That's that's not what we had discussed with the board oh, okay. before. Okay. Yeah. So, so yeah. what are the, just give me an idea for what it is they're concerned about that we yeah. can't try yeah. to continue to move this forward because we're really yeah. good at conversation. <coughs> yeah. I, I'll give you four points. The Please. first being, they are interested in discussing and exploring the rulemaking authority of the proposed committee. The rulemaking. Okay, yeah. that does not involve them. Uh, no, 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 no. But, but again, we are seeking to build a collaborative process, and that's why Who we are that? seeking. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Who said that? This is what we're. This is our problem with that's, the trails of Hopkinton. Yeah. We've been collaborating for thirty years and getting nothing, yeah. getting nothing done. Yeah. Right. Um, I, 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 again, remember, Open Space Preservation Committee holds substantial land on which trails are built. Similarly with the Conservation Commission, Planning Board generates a substantial amount of open space that is dedicated to this purpose. That's why we're meeting with those committees. Okay, those are yeah. fair points. Exactly. Second point. I didn't get um, to my butt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The second point, they also wanted to discuss with us opportunities that they see relative to how this advisory committee could build upon some relationship with independently elected boards. Uh, this is a dynamic that we run into in, in town, and now we have an opportunity to discuss that, how that might work upfront before we create a committee. So I think it's an important point of consideration. And then thirdly, they wanted to offer us uh, some suggestions in terms of how we can strengthen the role of this committee as a forum that all discussions pertaining to trails can okay. I think we, I think the board in your discussions did identify this proposed entity as the forum through which um, conversations could okay relating to trails. And now we have three committees that are substantial holders of land in town saying they want to give us more suggestions in terms of how we can do that. But that's what the committee's supposed to figure out, right? Not and, us. And, and if I may, if mm -hmm. I may, you know, mm -hmm. I, we have to be careful that this committee uh, doesn't uh, re doesn't end up almost reporting to the other three before they come up with something. You know, it's this is this is something that the that the board of selectmen was have, has been trying to get done for a while, and it's it's, it's I think it's fallen into a quagmire right now. I don't believe so. When, when we seek input, when we say we are inviting ideas, I find nothing wrong giving adequate time for that to occur. I did not sense, Elaine, feel free to jump in, I did not sense any idea uh, or any intention on the part of those three committees to hijack the process. It was a very free flowing discussion it was very forward-looking. It was very productive. And last but not least, the other piece that I wanted to discuss is how, in structuring this committee, we can account for the self-interest, realizing how many stakeholders are impacted by this process. Mm -hmm. So in my mind, those four points are enough reason to give us enough time, ample time, to continue this discussion. I'm mindful of what we are saying. This process finally is determined by the selectmen. We are not going to we're not going to take away from that 
uh, in our discussions. Uh, I, I, again, what I sensed in our conversation was a willingness to share ideas, a willingness to strengthen the, 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 the charge. Uh, and I am suggesting that we not miss that opportunity. Well, this is really tonight only the second night that we sat down with any kind of a, any kind of a document. So presumably this added input isn't going to drag on for too long. We, it's only the 18 years that I've been around. Yeah. Right. No, no, yeah. we talked about getting this uh, umbrella organization together because of various groups that have felt that they were, uh, there was no central, central contact point and no central planning. So... But he just described a very non-central discussion with a bunch of right. well-intended people. That is not the issue at all. No. But what you just described is just a continuation of what we've been doing in Hopkinton and for we, the 18 years I've been in. And we can always modify the charge. We can always modify something. What, what I'm saying is, let's get this started. We can always modify it. There's no, no you know, it, it can come up as an agenda item. We modify. We can have, have a public hearing. We're modifying the charge of the of the trails committee to meet this need no and and it, this isn't the really the st second time we've looked at it we were looking at it um, a few years ago when it, when i wasn't even in that chair and last year last year i was pushing it really hard and it never made it to the agenda to so the we could talk about it a while mr nasrula yeah um to be fair to mr kamalo and Ms. right um this is the second time we, we came up with this idea of having a committee um, we, we started out saying we need to deal with the trails. So how are we going to do it? We tasked Mr. Kamalo with a, with a, a task to go how we, figure out how we're going to do it. And he came up with an idea of, of a committee two meetings ago. Um, we set a deadline. And I wasn't part of this board for the previous 18 years or 15 years. So I don't know what else has gone on. But in this case, I'm, much. I'm, thinking, <laughs> I'm thinking that... <laughs> Usually institutional knowledge is very helpful, but maybe in this case it's not because we have a new committee and we have a direction, and I think what Mr. Kamala is asking is let, let that process play out. So getting back to Mr. Tedstone's first question, which is how much time do you think you need? I believe mid-January. We'll come back to the board mid-January. We've only got two more meetings. So two more meetings. Here, so. Come back to the board. And then fuse all those comments together into one document that we can that hopefully we'll settle vote on. on. Yes. Then we'll move on. Yeah. Yeah. That was supposed to be this one. I I I, I bit my oh. tongue on, on making a motion to adopt what we had at that last meeting. Yeah. I was ready to make a motion, and then I backed off because we already set a date of today to have this a document in front so, of us that we could then vote on. And so I, I won't go for mid-January. I'll go one more meeting. One more meeting is next week. Next week's meeting? Yes. Yes. Not one the other? I've got everything got pushed back because of Veterans Day this and Thanksgiving. We have, we have two in December, December 4th, December 18th. Yeah. Next meeting is next yes. week. Yes, <laughs> yeah. second half of the month is coming. Comes through the 18th. Well, you know, you also don't want to rush. I know, I know you're saying it's been going on forever, but rush it through and vote on something that's not right. What was put forth last meeting, I would not have voted on. It was way too complicated, way too onerous. I think what was distributed this week is better. It, it more reflects what I saw for a board. Um, Mr. Lagoy, as a matter of fact, I don't think it's been shared with everyone, but he put some thought into it and came up with some ideas and, and what I thought was a very concise, simplified um, purpose and goal, which kind of says everything that's in this, but distilled down into something that's a lot more readable and, and maybe less off-putting than this, this lengthy thing. So I think there's progress being made. Um, and, you know, just as we want to give, we want this evening to give some input to the Marathon Fund Committee so that they could work their charge, I, I don't see a problem with getting these other stakeholders if, if they get on it quickly enough so that we could act on it in another, say, two meetings on the 18th. 
as long as it doesn't drag on forever. I'd like to make a motion that we give, uh, we, that we, we put it off until the 18th and we vote on it on the 18th. No matter what? No matter what. Can you get it done by the 18th, reasonably? Yes. Well, that's if those committees can. There's three people. If the sports directive is the sports directive, we'll, we'll, we'll have to work towards meeting that goal. I'll second that motion. I'd like to offer a friendly amendment. <laughs> nice tone of voice. Go ahead. <laughs> friendly. Sounds friendly. That um, we have a goal of the 18th, but if we're not happy with what we're seeing um, and and more time is required, then that would be a goal, not like a, a hard deadline. Um, we feel the heat. <laughs> we we squishy, definitely feel the squishy, heat. Squishy, squishy, squishy. Um, <laughs> but I don't see any value in voting on something that's incomplete. I, I, I don't see this incomplete. I see Maybe it. That's not a friendly amendment. It's just commentary. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's still see. friendly though. <laughs> yeah, I don't see it as incomplete. I see it, you know we, we, we have a document. You know it's you know I, I, I was in product development for almost forty years, and in engineering, you know you can always make it better. Could give me two more days. I can do this. Give me another week. I can do this. Give me another thirty thousand dollars and this, and we can make it even better. But at some point, you have to release the product. Or it's already obsolete, mm -hmm. and and there have been people screaming to have have um, issues uh, fixed by this committee, and we've been putting it off. You know, it, it's been the the Upper Charles Trails Committee and the and the um, uh, and the running clubs and everybody else have, has have been doing this, and Mike Bolson's been handling all the all the maintenance all the, and everything, and we keep putting it off and putting it off. At some point, we have to release a document that's that's good enough. What's General Patton? It was, he says, you know, I'll I'll take a I'll take a a, 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 a half baked plan executed violently over a perfect one not executed at all. So you know, I don't want to be at that point. We've got to at some point do something. I I just don't want to. No one's more impatient about this than me. But maybe you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> maybe you are. Um, but I don't want to put undue pressure on our colleagues who've got all kinds of other stuff yeah. going on in yeah. two weeks before the holidays, yeah. and then there's other personal commitments and things. And I, as much as I want this done now, I'm a little concerned that you know he's not comfortable um, with the squeeze on the date. And as much as I like to have fun with him and argue a little bit every now and then, I defer to him on 99% of the stuff. And yeah. I'm here. I'm feeling it sitting next to him that he would rather yeah. we do this in January. Then which which that. meeting in January then? Can we do the first meeting in January? You know, I just don't want to put this because then then there'll be a snowstorm and and we're into February, and then it's. I hear you. Let's see what mm -hmm. the, what's the schedule in January. Yeah. Fifteenth. Yes, the fifteenth. That's exactly what you asked for. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Fine. I'll withdraw my my motion. You will, will. Thank you. Well, I will withdraw my second. Okay. Now I'll make All a motion right. that we do it on the January fifteenth, <laughs> and no matter what, we are going to vote up or down. If you want, uh, yeah, up or down. Second. Comment on the motion? Well, I mean, I'm going to vote against it because I, I hear what you're saying. I just, I think we've all got the message that we want to do, we don't want to let this drag on interminably, but it has to be done right and we have to respect the needs of the other colleagues. And so I would, I would take that as a goal, but I don't think it needs to be a hard, fast motion and Oh, but it's been made but and if, seconded. If the town manager said that that's the time frame that he wants and he can get it done, 
at that well, in then that let's time just, frame. Then let's just have that on the agenda. But I so just speaking to the general topic in the motion, I guess, um, part of this obviously is the composition, that who's going to be on this committee. And um, while I think there's been a lot of uh, points made over the months and years about different things and how we appoint different people from different committees to represent, um, maybe this is one of those committees where it shouldn't be as many people from different committees to represent, like planning board and open space and all these others, and it should be more a user type committee and less of, you know, quote, appointed or elected officials doing yet another thing in town. Maybe some more ideas come in this committee as well. So just the thought as you work towards this date, if we vote this date, mm -hmm. that maybe that composition might be different this go around than it was traditionally been in the past. I personally would like to see newer trails oriented, non-elected or appointed types or more of that and fewer to the typical con com open space planning board selectmen yada yada yada. Um, well, I know it's getting late, but we did come prepared to discuss some of this. Um, could the board give some input now as to what we've seen so far with what's been presented to us tonight? Because I think we thought we were going to take some action tonight. So, do members have comments about what's been discussed so far? For instance, to your point, Mr. Herr, about the board composition, I think the new iteration that Mr. Kamala put out addressed that by uh, saying, not making it a representative of, but one member who is recommended by yeah, Parks and Rec. And it says committees mm -hmm. are recommending members may recommend more than one, uh, blah, blah, blah. But yeah, parks, there's, there's some good board. stuff in here already. Can yeah. can we use the time and, and, and give a little large. feedback back now? And five associates. Yeah. Well, I just gave mine. So yeah. I, yeah. Mm -hmm. So we have seven and five. Oh, we have a motion on the table. Yes. Yes, we do. We right. have a motion on the, the motion. table, which has been seconded to require. So can I make a friendly amendment to yes, this motion? Please, Mr. I don't Tenster. think that we can say no matter what because okay. if it uh, if it does snow and and we the meeting is canceled, then uh, we still have to vote no matter what. So let's get the no matter what out of there and and go from there. Okay. So can we read what the motion is? Yes. <laughs> Peter did. Again, respectfully. The board has made its point. <laughs> I don't think it's necessary to move a motion. Okay. The town manager understands the board's directive. Good. I withdraw my motion again. Thank I'm keeping the second. Yeah. But I didn't second. <laughs> and my <All> second. Right. <laughs> you got the point. Okay. But I like the composition. And now that we're doing oh, something else. They, so yeah. it, it's going to be how many voting official members? Five. No, seven. Uh, seven, seven, seven. 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 So four, I would like four, to see five. four be user groups. Four at large. And three be. Um, so who else? There's, parks, well, there's the parks and Rec, yeah. Con Com, and Planning Board already. And, and then among the members at large, the language oh. says um, uh, those recommended need not be members. All members shall have a demonstrated interest in the development, management, and use of public trails. So maybe we don't have to necessarily specify that those members be Trails Club, Hall, Scouts, Running Club, but if that's sort of a, a requirement, it could be made known to those groups when, when uh, there's a spot available and you, you would expect that someone who would apply would have that, in, that, that knowledge. And that's four, so that's the, that's that's the, four. That's the majority of the seven, that's right. my interest. Right. Mm -hmm. And then the other three are Planning Board, Conservation Commission, and Open Space. Recommended, Recommended by. by. It, it could yes. be one of them or somebody else, but it's or those not. three plus Correct. four at large with those qualifications. Yeah. And, and there's a possibility after the board has been constituted for a year to name five associates if they so desire who would be non-voting. That's fine. Um, point of clarity, it's, there is no member from uh, Open Space Commission. It's Planning Board, ConCom, and yeah. Parks and Rec. Yeah. Okay. So. Yeah. Should we make that a requirement and then there's uh, then there's three members at large? Mm -mm. Mm -hmm. My thing is the four the user groups need to be the majority of that group. Yeah. 
to that committee. Mm -hmm. That's a different dynamic, and mm -hmm. I, I think that's important. Yeah. I agree. Um, the only the only thought I have on this is that I think, and I think I think the town officials could probably do this, <laughs> just representing the interests of the butters. Um, about our rights on the, on the trails. Well, since yeah. the trails were all over the town, it's hard to figure out. Right. Well, that's why I think the town. But I think everybody, because here, since, since trails go by just about everybody's house, we're, we're all almost abutters. Yeah. You can take your, your back of your house, too. Find yeah. Your house. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like in, in, <laughs> in fact, just, just to complement what the, what the board is raising, we, we did have an, an, an extended discussion internally, also together with the representatives of the uh, with the chairs of the planning board and the uh, and the conservation commission with regard to whether we should actually identify the private groups in the charge we decided not to identify the private groups in the charge because the town has no control over the mandate of those groups and whether they could continue to exist or not for example if a private group disbands and the name is on the charge <laughs> It will take a long process to, to change that. That's why we left the groups unidentified. Okay. All right. Yeah, we ran into that with um, the Woodville Historical District, where we said we needed a real estate person. We couldn't find a real estate person, yeah. so somebody else came up and they said, well, we have to fill the seat. Mm -hmm. you know, sometimes they, okay, so can we move forward saying that we, we think the, 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 um, the way the board is recommended to be constituted seems to make sense? Yes. Half yes. of that. Okay, so that's one thing we can work with. Um, I just want to put out, and we can think about it uh, again. The purpose and the charge. I thought they were all very good items, but it's very long and very complex. Um, and I just wanted to read, and maybe we can think about this for next time. What Mr. Lugoy had sent. He, he boiled down the purpose and the goals into a couple of very succinct statements. Purpose. If I may, sorry. Could I, yeah? Sorry to interrupt you. Yeah. We have an email from Peter from today. Okay. Subsequent to what he sent. Yeah. And the email is very brief. I've looked over the most recent committee charge in the BOS packet, and I think it looks pretty good. Mm -hmm. Still would suggest making sure folks currently working on and using trails are well represented on the committee, but the two options are not mutually exclusive. Oh, cool. Yeah. yeah. But I think we just covered that with composition. So right. Yeah. Composition. And I, it, yeah. So I don't see this as a as a half baked document at all. You know, when you were no. just say, when you were saying, you know, it, it earlier that you know we beat this up at our last meeting. But he, the, the, where it's but, coming from is right. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So in, in the enforcement thing that other, I think some people have suggested they want to kick around, uh, or the well, maybe enforcement's the word, but the regulation uh, piece of this that should come out. Uh, we have to be careful with that. We cannot dilute that a whole lot because one of the problems we have right now is there is no central authority. So we mm -hmm. need this committee has to create, this charge has to create a central authority with an appeal process which would come to the Board of Select. And I, and I'm not sure what else you need to sort out with whomever, but sort it out. But I don't see how you, you cannot dilute the central authority of this committee or we're wasting our time and that's where i was getting to with <laughs> with this meeting i want to make sure that that they're not snipped with uh, with any of that authority by the uh, these other committees mm -hmm. it, in in fact in our discussions um there was a suggestion that perhaps we should look at mimicking the structure of the weed of the lake mass panel weed advisory committee um, as you recall a town meeting the suggestion was that that committee should report to some official uh, professional uh, versus having the committee report to the board of selectmen and it ended up staying with the board of selectmen didn't it no town meeting advisor did report to the director of public works for that sixty thousand dollars. Yeah, that was only going forward. Yeah, yeah but I don't, I don't think that's the same scenario as what we're talking yeah. about here. Right. Yeah. Is this all stuff you can get hashed out for the next meeting? Right. Well, because mm -hmm. because that, 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 yeah. that cut them. From midnight. That, that took away their authority. Just, just, just the opposite. To offer feedback for what you're going to work on between yeah. now and mid-January. Yeah. 
if it comes back highly diluted and there's no central authority of this committee that we're forming, of all these volunteers that are well informed, and the appeal to the Board of Selectmen, then I would have a strong issue with the document. Okay. Well, As one member. I want to just a comment to Mr. Herr. Uh, you're talking about things not being diluted and having authority, and yet when I read through the way this, this is written, the words that came out to me were rec make recommendations, advise, participate, recommendation, recommendation, recommend, encourage, um, coordinate. I don't see real strong action words there. It seems much more for the subcommittee for the trails. This is committee. The trails committee. Yeah. yeah. It doesn't seem to have. I mean, I, I wanted to see something in here that actually talked about somehow um, coordinating the actual construction of the trail. Like if they look at the whole picture and say this is a key point that really needs it, that they you know direct the various entities to get that done. But I don't see a lot of action. Mm. I saw this as, as I, like I, the marathon committee. It, exactly. The, the marathon committee, they, they vet everything out, and then they bring us the um, hockey bags, the right, the, right, the, 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 the shirts, yep. right. and the and the porta potties. And it's like, okay. Uh, this is the way I kind of envisioned it being. But Mr. Hur, you seem to be looking for something that has a lot more power t behind it. I'm not sure about the power so much as centrally focused. That's what I'm looking for. Oh, okay. So, yeah. what I need, what I would like to see, because this is what's been missing in my view over the years, is we've got four or five entities all yeah. trying to do the right thing, yeah. uh, but having a hard time kind of coordinating. This central authority, this central group, can you know, pull it all together and figure it all out as best they can. And the key decisions are still going to come to the board of selectmen because it's going to be land issues and but really only the dollar, really only the dollar issues need right. to come to right. the board of selectmen. Yeah. So that's kind of my thinking. If Everything else they can handle. Those words, I hear what you're saying and pointing out those words. So maybe some of those words are recommend, some of those words are they shall. They okay. Don't. okay. Mm -hmm. Can I share with the board just the wording that Mr. Legoy came up with? Because I thought it was very concise and it was um, spoke to what I, what I envisioned this committee being. Um, the wording was for the purpose being one advise and provide recommendation to the Board of Selectmen on matters concerning the design, development, and maintenance of the town's trail system. Two, promote a cohesive vision for the development, preservation, management, and sustainability of the town's trail network to serve the residents of the community. And three, serve as a point of contact for all town trail-related issues for town residents and other town committees and groups. And the goals were summarized as the overall goal of the Trails Committee would be to recommend to the selectmen and work to develop and maintain a connected, well-coordinated system of trails to serve the residents of the community, linking neighborhoods, schools, town conservation land, recreation land, and open space, and providing connections with regional trail systems and open space in neighboring communities. Um, we might look at that going forward. I, I just saw, thought that was very concise and, in my view, summed up a lot more succinctly than this. And I think in that, where you read the charge, I think the third point, if you could add the word, some, or at least the idea that we just talked about, and the, the first line of decision making, or the first, or the, the initial decision making body. Mm -hmm. Something along those, something like that. You know what I mean? So, in other words, the the committee's being put in place, and it has responsibility, and it has authority. There's nothing more frustrating than being appointed to something and having no authority to get anything done, right? We all do that at work sometimes, and yeah, it, it, and, and other entities too, including local government. Mm -hmm. So let's make sure the committee has authority, the first line of authority, or however you word that. I yeah, we're, we're primary responsibility. Yeah. Primary responsibility. Initial responsibility. Initial, initial like responsibility. That. Whatever yeah. it is. Okay. To be able to pull that word initial responsibility to decide as opposed to recommend. Yeah. Determine. And determine whatever, yeah. Okay. You know, until it involves money. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, land is land acquisition. Well, That's it's money. money. Yeah. Okay. That's money. Yeah.
you know, because we give them a budget for the, for for trail maintenance and everything else. You know, they're not going to come to us. Okay, we have a hundred thousand dollars to spend. You know, it's like, can we spend ten thousand on this? No, they've already got a hundred thousand to spend and make sure they use it correctly. We have to leave it up to them to so just like the marathon fund committee. They have X amount of dollars. They vet out the the um, recommendation, the stuff that comes in, the requests, and then they make recommendations for us to sign the checks. Okay, that's okay. good progress. Other, other comments? Any input, Mr. Marlow? Anybody else? <laughs> that's some guidance. <laughs> we've made some progress. Yeah, we've made good progress. I think we have a clear deadline. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you think? <laughs> yeah. yeah. We, we, we also identified, uh, I think, a couple of things that also line up with what we're discussing with the chairs uh, of the good. planning board and the conservation commission, and we will help on the board's recommendations. Good. Okay. All right. Good for now. All right. Great. Well, thank you for sticking with us and at least going over a little bit of this. We have something something out of this meeting. Um, is there anything more with town manager's report? That that was all. Just the trails. Yes, yeah, just the trails. Just the trails. Thank you. Okay, uh, moving on, almost done, liaison reports, board invites. Does anybody have any uh, liaison uh, updates or reports to share? I have nothing. The only thing I'd like to, I don't know if I would mention it here, is uh, the holiday stroll, I believe it's this weekend. Mm -hmm. And uh, it would be nice to see the town come out and see Santa go by on the, you know, the old antique fire truck. And, Support some of our local businesses. Great. Skip me for one second. <coughs> I don't have any official uh, liaison reports, but um, similar to Mr. Tedstone, um, this is uh, this week is the celebration of Diwali for a lot of our Indian neighbors, and I actually met with a with a group that's trying to form a uh, an organization. The South Asian Circle of Friends of Hopkinton, and uh, they're going to be hosting a Diwali party on December first for both Hopkinton and Holliston at the Holliston Town Hall. Cool. So it'd be uh, great if we could support them. <laughs> no, no, I I have one that's uh, I'm I'm on the Zoning Advisory Committee again, and this isn't it's not a liaison or anything, but um, what came up from Mike Shepard was. Um, they want to put some guidelines for mobile vendors and food trucks, food truck kind of a thing. And um, it, well, you know, it, it was it was looked at, at at the at zoning as a more of a general bylaw. It would have to be, and general bylaws have to come from the board of selectmen. And so I just figured I'd mention that that is something that um, that uh, I won't be going to the planning board, but that's something they wanted us to take a look at. Do those food trucks go through, like Board of Health? Yes. yes. They have so in order to come into town. Yeah. An ice cream truck. And yeah. Snap it yeah. 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 And then there was another one where hours of business operation, but they were going. And, and I thought that was also um, uh, came through the uh, Board of Selectmen, but uh, they're looking to do it through um, different zones, so okay. it may not be through the uh, Board of Selectmen. And last but not least, for the exciting committee that I'm both liaison to and chairman of, uh, I will report on Cemetery Commission that actually this is a first in, in public records availability, uh, the completion of a long-standing <laughs> CPC project. Uh, we have now got all of the town's cemetery records up available to the public online, um, which means genealogy is huge. Anybody in any part of the country who's trying to do research on family member can get onto our website and go. It's available either through eGov or through the Cemetery Commission website and get into all the town's records. So any kind of family history research, gene genealogy research, um, very few towns have these records now available online, but Hopkinton is a first, so they're all up there. If you genealogy researchers out there uh, want some help, we, the 
the Cemetery Commission and the Historical Society get a lot of requests trying to find information on family members and heretofore someone has had to take the time to do the digging to try to go through all kinds of records and it's up there now online for, for everybody to do their own family research. So it's, an, it's a nice benefit for, for the community. So with that, uh, are there any future agenda items that anyone would like to ask for? I think I'm good. You good? <laughs> <laughs> you made enough trouble tonight, John. I'm all set. Thank you. All right. Hearing none, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, H. Cam, one more time. Thank you.